over a thousand. Welcome to the Warren Finance Committee meeting for March 21st, 2022. The first thing on the agenda is to salute the fire. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Chairman, may I say something before we start? Yes. Uh, I know the library is on our uh, agenda tonight, and it does seem to me if the library people would like things to go like they did at the school committee, one of their people should have brought more chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> <laughs> That's a thought. That's a thought. Perhaps you mean one batch of cookies doesn't cover two cookies? <laughs> no. Guys. Short memory. Be a heads up. Short, Short memories. memories. <laughs> Short memories. <laughs> they were very good chocolate chip cookies. Thank you. My secret recipe is on the back of the Toll House uh, <laughs> chocolate chip bag. Well, I'll mine back because I didn't get to vote. <laughs> <laughs> Um, They're behind it. Talking about voting, there will be no votes tonight. Because um, we don't have anything officially yet from the Slotman to vote on, so. Do we know, um, have you heard when we may be receiving the warrants? I, the plan is, they have another budget workshop tomorrow, and hopefully the Slotman will approve the warrants tomorrow night. Wednesday night, you mean? Yeah, Wednesday night, sorry. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if they get through all of them or not, but they're gonna make an effort to get through most of them, I think. Um, so the first thing on the agenda, and I think I'm gonna do these all at one time, is to approve the minutes uh, for February 10th, March 10th, as you can see, both those were school meetings. March 14th um, was when we met with the road commissioners. Uh, March 15th was also a school budget meeting. And March 17th was when we voted on the budget. So I'd ask for a motion to approve all these minutes at once. So moved. Just, okay. Any discussion? Mr. Chairman, if I may, if you look at your papers you have the Wharton Finance Committee of, of March 14th is a separate minutes are separate minutes yeah. February 10th March 3rd March 10th and March 15th are all uh, with the school committee and they are on one sheet and they are uh, simply what we went through uh, at article by article the articles are numbered in here and um and what the secretary meant by what we went through she just forgot to say it was a very pleasurable experience well so we again, weren't very twisted if you read the note on the bottom <laughs> <laughs> dennis long thanked the school committee for the congenial spirit of the meetings the school committee chair judy shank also thanked the committee for their attendance in the interest in the process of constructing the budget at the school. I, I, it was just a great, for meetings, it was it was a number one great meeting. Yeah. I have only one comment. Yeah. On the March 17th, which was last Thursday. Yeah. Um, it says vote was 7-0, but there's only six names listed. I was at that meeting. That's right, 6-0. Six 6-0. Zero. Six zero. Okay, but I was at that meeting, so. Yeah. What meeting were you not at? But, but it wouldn't matter. The most we have is six anyway. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's okay. only six voting members. Six right. voting members. Okay. Okay. Take your pens, everybody. I'm not going to rewrite them. <laughs> Turn that six to a seven or seven to a six. Yep. And on March 14th, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Wharton Finance member Margarita Borgo created a spreadsheet including the percentage increases requested by the uh, road commissioner. We thank you for that, Marguerite. No, that was you. a great job. So, 
we have um, a motion. Well, we need a motion to you have accept the, motion. the minutes as amended. Correction. Correction. I don't know who Ray Ramirez is. Uh, that's probably you in another life. Oh, yeah, that's your cousin. My aliases are catching up to me. Yeah, yeah. they are. I think it's your cousin, right? Maybe you used to be Irish, didn't you? <laughs> I was. <laughs> I am sometimes still. You know? <laughs> All in favor? Six zero. I would like, starting with um, Phil, go around the table and introduce yourself to a uh, librarian, Elise Miller. And she's been our librarian for, I don't know how long, quite a while. Eight years. Eight years. Uh, so that she, the, the ladies will be familiar who they're answering questions for. Okay. Phil Caruso, I'm an alternate on the committee. Started a month or two ago, I guess. Nice to meet you. I was at the school board meeting, which were very good. Ray, last name changes here and there. <laughs> From the Warren <laughs> No, Ray Lopez, uh, Warren Frank. Leslie Berlin, I got four pesos on my papers. Dennis Long. Joyce Bakshi. Tucker Pearson. Joe Ruma. Margarita Borgo. I, we have. Well, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So, just I'm a director at the library, I'm not a librarian. A lot of people confuse it, but there are differences between them. I group. apologize. My aunt okay. was a librarian for 40 years, and I just grew up knowing how to spell that word. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of R's that some people forget to say. They're, they're exactly. <laughs> so, what, what's your really title? Director. Really? Yeah. She runs everything. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the librarian always did. Yeah. Almost. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> almost. <laughs> I'm CJ Gardner. Today, I'm here for the library uh, board of trustees. I'm Deb Robertson. I'm also on the library board of trustees. Thank you, ladies, for coming. Uh, I see you're asking for how much increase this year, at it's least? It's a 3%. 3%. What I, I understand pretty well what you do, uh, but for the new members here, we have six new members on the board this year. And so I would like for you to do is just explain some of the programs that you do that some people wouldn't think maybe the library doesn't do this stuff. Uh, I know you do some children's programs and you, and you, get, and you uh, do some grant work uh, to help offset the cost of the library and things like that. So what I was hoping was that you could just give it an overview of what, what you do and what you'd like to do. Right, so we run a story hour once a week um, for the children from preschool to whatever age because we have a lot of homeschool families. Um, we have gotten grants on the back in the in the past. One was to put a story walk in at the Mary Grant Nature Preserve. Um, a second grant was to offer adult adulting life skills for teenagers, uh, not teen to young adult. We have run other programs. I've tried to run programs for older people. Uh, we've had the Alzheimer's group come in. I'd like to get more of that in. Program, some programs cost money, which is why I get, I apply for grants for those. But for our regular operating budget, um, we also run the summer reading program. Try to get the kids to keep reading through the summer. And each week they can come in. If they've read so much um, time, it's like 20 minutes a day for five or seven days. So they, get, they come in and get prizes. Yep. Um, a lot of those prizes are donated. I try to get as much donated. Um, I try not to use a lot of taxpayer money for programming, but sometimes, we, you know, we do have a budget line in there for the children's programming, just in case. Um, this year, we, we haven't been asking for museum passes because of the COVID, so we've been um, lucky to have a, dona a donation to um, offer the Strawberry Bank Museum Pass, which often went up. It went out often in the past, but with COVID, people are just being shy. Plus, Strawberry Bank has run um, a little bit tighter of a ship, so they their program isn't fully open. So, what else am I missing? Um, 
Well, we offer um, 24 7 Wi Fi. Um, so even if the library is not open, somebody can be in the parking lot and, and get on Wi Fi. Um, when the library is open, there's two computers available for people to come in to use. Um, Which I do offer um, adult computer skills. Okay just because a lot of people come in and don't know how to use the computers or even sometimes their Gmails and I, I'm there for them. Sometimes they'll come in with their cell phone trying to, I'm just almost like a, a walk-in Google. Yeah. <laughs> printing, <laughs> printing, copier, and fax services too. Yeah, <clears throat> um, so I scan documents for people and get them emailed off to, you know, social security, taxes, all kinds of stuff. Oh, wow. yeah. Direct the people stopping for directions. Mm -hmm. I proctor exams. I've done quite a, f a handful of exams over the years. So there's a lot of services that we have DVDs. In addition to learning books. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. right. We do have books. So. We've actually had, um, I wanted to point out, our, our new patrons, we've had 54 new patrons come in between June and December last year, which is more than we had all year previously. So there, we are getting more. Um, people coming full time. Wow. You guys probably already know that. <laughs> Do you think any of that at least is um, where the, the development in town um, with older citizens? You know, you know what I mean? They're moving into town. I mean, we haven't seen an influx of school children. No. Um, you know, but you, so you have an older community. It that's is mostly in. Um, adults that came in. Yeah. Uh, we've had a, at least I know of a few families that, when, when COVID came around, they sold their house elsewhere and stayed. Yeah. Their summer home. Mm-hmm. That's good. Yeah. So, anybody have any questions? You had a program with a raised bed out front with a little garden. How, how successful was that? Um, we had four kids show up for that. I'll, I'll probably do some, now that it's there, I, I'll be able to offer programs that... Is it an educational type of thing or is it... Yes, that was the adulting... Um, I mean, how to plant or plant seeds or what is it? Joan Nass came in and, and yeah. did the teaching for that. Oh, Joan Nass did it. Yeah. Our goal was to have it, so it was paid for and developed under a grant um, to help young people learn how to grow food. Um, but our long-term goal is to make a little community garden kind of space. Oh, wow. That'd be very uh, cool. We just got it last year, so yeah. now that spring's around the corner, we'll start to figure out what that So what when you apply for the grant, did that def they clearly define what you can or can't do with the space or the No, program? no, once, no. No. Just, so, just the re re remaining uh, money that we have for the grant. We can only do offer adulting them. skills with that. Adulting skills in gardening or adulting skills in reading um, or anything? No, we, we have quite a few categories. We've had sewing. Um, this In May, we're going to do auto uh, roadside service, how to change a tire. With baking? Baking. We've done baking. Um, we did a financial literacy. We did a local, 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 government. local government literacy. What else have we done? Cassie came in and did first aid. first aid. So you get quite a following with all that. Different, different people coming in. Yeah, but another yeah. topic. Yeah. I mean, it was we were doing it with masks on, so it was the all through COVID. So yeah. attendance wasn't think, that great, but it was been in good. A different time, there would have been a much greater interest in it. But you know, we were doing it last year, which was not the mm -hmm. ideal time to offer in-person classes and stuff <laughs> so this year should look a little different hopefully yeah <clears throat> all this is on on the town's website I would think no it's on the library website oh. not very well done because I'm not tech savvy I don't have, I don't have an IT department <laughs> and like so I said I said before Phil uh, just so everybody's clear uh, the library is not a department of the town right and that's why it wouldn't be on the town website that's a private entity, right? Yeah, 501c3. Yeah. So yeah. is it your your website the only way you promote these programs? Facebook. Facebook website and the reporter hmm. and flyers. All right. Now, I, I, have, I have a question. This is probably going to be more geared toward the selectman answering than, than you, Elise. Um, you don't pay rent, right? Correct. You don't pay electric? Correct. You don't pay heat? Correct. All right. It wouldn't make sense for me to because then I'd be asking for more, more money. 
Well, I mean, we're, the town is paying for it anyway, right. just in transparency. Okay. It, you know, uh, I, I guess my thoughts are we should know what, you know, that, that actually is part of our donation. Mm -hmm. um, and and I'm, I'm not suggesting that we need to make a change with how anything is operated other than allocate the services that you use in the building have it allocated to the library rather than just the whole town hall because if you if you know if something ever happened and you needed to move the library somewhere else those are expenses that you would need to pay mm -hmm. anyway um, and, and it's like I said it's I'm not advocating a change for the way right. we um, we fund the library because I think you guys do a great job and it's a valuable resource yeah. to have in town um, but I just for transparency I think that Definitely good to note that somewhere. Well, I, I, and, I and like I said, I think it's it's probably a, a selectman um, question. Th this has been brought up before, Leslie, mm -hmm. and my experience with conversations with people in the past to try to decipher what the actual cost, uh, what she might use for lights, for example, uh, or heat to to separate that out from the rest of the building uh, it would take a lot smarter guy than me to uh, you know you got so many the, the insulation factor you've got now a couple of years ago at least um, had all the lights changed in there to all efficiency lighting um, which ob obviously saves quite a bit of money oh absolutely but the rest of the town hall hasn't been done so to break that out, conversations with people in the past would be almost impossible to have uh, even an estimated number because if the, the electricity hours operation is, and you have to have separate electric meter for yeah, yeah, yeah and you, propane. You, you have to do a, you know some some sort of a formula where you know you look at the number of hours guess. open and whatever. It, and it, it would be a wild guess. Um, one thing you forgot at least was your um, chili. Oh, the Crock Fest. Oh, we have two major, two major fundraisers each year that 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 is on you know in here. Um, the Chili Fest in the first weekend of November, and then um, our book um, plant and pie sale. Not bake. We just do pies, and the pies fly. <laughs> so that that That's brings insane. in. They both bring in good money. Yeah. I have a question. You say you were talking, thinking about doing an expanse on the like, gardening. They do it as a community type of situation. Mm -hmm. um, where would that be happening? If, I mean, obviously you'd have a lot more use of land. Well, I. Okay, so I'll ask. So we have, um, as part of the adulting program that we ran last year, um, in partnership with a local Girl Scout who was earning her gold badge, um, we built one raised bed outside the library. Um, and so young adults learned how to plant, um, what kinds of things grow well in Maine, how to cultivate that soil to, to make it effective. Um, so that was our first year using it, and so we've had talks about planting again um, in that bed and making it something where young people can come in and learn more about that but what that looks like for the spring we haven't really figured out but it's just that one raised bed yeah, the yeah i was just wondering if you had made any plans or had looked at the amount of space that you would uh that would be necessary in order to go with a community mm -hmm. type of garden mm -hmm. i mean that's usually a, a little bit more than a raised bed a community garden might be not quite the right I think maybe yeah. Maybe that's Term not really work the right is word. when you when in most in most cities when you think of community garden like Sanford has community garden where it's like plots that families can come in and this right. is mine and that's yours and that's yours and that's yours yeah. and this is more like we're gonna have a couple of you know carrots and a couple of tomato plants and like oh my seven year old is gonna come in and go like oh this is a tomato let me water it yeah. like ah yeah. oh, okay. Yeah. And like Elise is going to say, oh, well, yeah, here is how peas grow. And look, you have to put a stake in it so they can go up. And, and will you... We're teaching kids who come through about okay. like how to do it a little bit and not my yeah. family is allocated slot yeah. A2. Yeah. 
You're not were selling you sell CSAs. The, you sell the produce or where you donate the produce? No, it's just small. Area. No, okay. it's just small it, stuff. It That's like, what I figured. Like five tomatoes and six peas. Like. Yeah. <laughs> I'd probably eat some of it when I came to a meeting. You know, just You're not selling food. shares yet, right? Not yet. <laughs> Kids tend probably to, twice. are they more apt to eat or try what they grow and, you know, yes. promotes them eating yeah. more vegetables? That's very cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if, you know, if someone's grandchildren come through and they've never eaten a tomato before, yeah, and say, oh, Absolutely. take a tomato and try it. And then you can water the plant and see what comes next. It would be more learning experience than community yes. garden. Right. Yeah. 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 That's a good question. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, how is the library heated? Is that part of the town hall? It's the propane. They have, have a monitor propane heater. Is this separate than the town hall? No. They they ran a line somehow, under or along the outside of the building or something. All right, so it's all fit out of the same tank, Joe. When you leave, you, you you turn your thermostat down and, and then you, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm you're talking to a leaf. <laughs> yeah, really. Of course she does. When I leave, and I have okay. it on a timer to go on ten minutes before. Okay, I no, I, I was just curious as to where because <laughs> fifty eight uh, gets cold because it, the yeah. town now has air conditioning, I believe. And yeah. I just wonder, are you part of that air conditioning? No, I have one that goes in the window. Okay. No, she isn't, Joe. I spoke to her about this last year. Yeah. And. I think what she said was, I had no idea that the town hall would ever put air conditioner in, so I never thought about it. I never thought to ask. Yeah. Um, never. But myself personally, um, another year, I would ask for it. Because I, I know how some old the buildings are, and I know how warm they get. And with these new systems, uh, they're pretty efficient. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't think it costs any more money than what it's costing now to heat it with a, I mean, uh, use the air condition with a window one. You know what I mean? And yeah. It'd probably be cheaper. And you get that yeah. climate control, which would be good for the box. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, at, at another year I would, just me, I, w I would ask for it. I didn't know if Joe was thinking there might be a hot story in there or something that needed to. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, on a more serious note, so basically what you're running is you're running uh, your budget from a year to year basis. Yes. You don't plan out five years as a short term goal or. That is on, on the agenda to do a five year strate strategic plan. That's on the board, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah, that would be with the board of trustees, yeah. <laughs> Right. That's what I was going to ask. In the next five years, what do you anticipate uh, your needs or the things that you'd like to have within the next five years? Or building maintenance-wise, or in, well, the whole thing, room. all of it. Yeah. Are you is but there's need for building maintenance, or no? We, I think we're all. Um, I, I'd like to ha have someone look at the insulation underneath. I know there isn't any. Mm -hmm. Um, just like this one was. or actually it's uh, sorry they put in something different but I'll, look, I'll have to look at that they I, fixed that a few years back yeah the foundation the, the, right after we did the carpeting yeah, yeah. Um, Pat Stevens Shard did it came in and did mm -hmm. something. Oh, you know what I'm thinking of they he talked about putting a dehumidifier in and that never happened Mm. That would have been like a phase two thing. And with your climate control. If you do the mini splits, those have a built-in dehumidifier. Yeah, it, it would, it would do the whole thing. Under the building. Ah. Mm. Well, especially with books. Yeah. H humidity is a... Well, do you, you see yourself in... I know we're getting off no, we're this right. year's budget, but it's important to know. Do you see yourself running... I know how tight space is, so I'm just uh, throwing this out there running out of space in the next five, ten years, or next year? Possibly. I, I, you know, I'm at the point where when I order new books and need to put them on the shelf, I have to get rid of books yeah. to make room, because it's just limited space in there. So you're already at limited space. Mm -hmm. And we have no storage. Sorry? No storage. No, oh yeah, I, I know. That, Closet, a little closet. Yeah. With tiny closet. Well, for the, it would be great to have a shed. <laughs> for the uh, new members that don't know, um, 
that was a school uh, before they closed the schools and uh, they decided to use that building for the library. So it was never built for a library. And so the library is under the restrictions of what they had for school in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think at least does a great job to manage in that small mm -hmm. area. Anybody else? Bill East is chairman of the Warren Finance Committee. Um, my perspective, uh, you've been very conservative with the town in the past years. I appreciate all the programs and things that you guys do. Uh, now I will admit publicly, I'm not a participator in the library. But um, I think you're the salt of the earth and I support everything you ask for here. And please get that climate control out of the slotman next year. I think you'll be much happier in the summer and your books will be that much happier too. And just in case you may want to put a literacy program in, Okay, you could invite me. <laughs> <laughs> I'd probably come. <laughs> Elise, I would also like to add that um, phase two that you talked about next year, please put put that in. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid to ask for that as well. Um, and for transparency, I did volunteer at the library, and I am a former trustee, so I know when I'm asking about the storage space and um, the closet, sometimes one brown shopping bag does not have a space in that storage closet. I mean, it is that tight, and um, you do a great job. You do a great job. I can't do it without my board. They're very supportive. We are looking for some more um, yeah. bodies on our board. <laughs> we have, um, CJ is leaving our board in May. Her term runs up. And we have a secretary seat open and two, two other seats mm -hmm. open. So. Oh, I could take notes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't spell well. I okay. do. I did. All right. No, Joyce, you're right. I can't take notes. No, I can't no. I do, but I can't. So hopefully it wasn't too bad for you girls tonight. No. Ladies, I mean, I apologize. Good thing. Uh, this should be in your book. Did you guys get a breakout in my book, or did you just get no. one number? No, we didn't. We, got we just got number. your bottom number. Do you want the rest of it? Sure. sure. Have to have. I thought that's what it was. All that work you did, of course we want to see it. Ooh, Definitely. Do you want? Yeah, that'd be good. If you could, yeah, thank you. Eight of us. Yeah, I, when he was doing the math on the 3%, I thought, is that in your book? <laughs> <laughs> no, we, all we got, at least, is just the uh, initial. We haven't got anything from the Board of Selectmen yet. Oh. oh. Basically, just okay. listed with donations. Okay. So they've been a little bit um, <clears throat> behind this year. And we're still trying to get everybody to come in so we can get through the process, as you, you know, the process, and so that when it comes time, we can all vote on the stuff and put it behind us. Well, wait, thank you all. I all was just going to say that. <laughs> thank you. Are doing on this because it's a lot of meetings. It's a lot of work, and it's really important, and we appreciate your presence. Last week, I said to my granddaughter. She goes, how many more meetings do you have? I said, honey, I got five this week. <laughs> <laughs> and five last week. But this is, you know, it's a busy time of year. Yeah. You know, the school's behind us. And, uh, so now we just have the town stuff. Yeah. And CJ is getting those for each of us, so it'll just yes. be a minute. And yeah. the only social services... Uh, that we've had come in front of us so far is just you at least. 
we don't know what the sun they're putting forward yet for social services. You know what I mean? So all those donations, mm -hmm. I don't know what they're doing. So we're just trying to get through the stuff and get information from people like you. And lots of times, it's kind of like when we was down to school, you know. Like I said, we got a lot of new members this year, and you go down there and the way they explain things, you'll leave the school understanding completely uh, what's going on and why and stuff like that. And, you do a great job. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, you did the same thing tonight. Minus the cookies. <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know. Oh. Don't get rid of that crock fest. No, we'll that have it at the barn, is, barn lights nice. again. Yeah. Are they gonna donate it again? Yep. That's so good. Hopefully we'll, <laughs> we did not expect that many people last year. No. It was crazy. My mom brought two crocs and she ran out. Yeah. I brought one, but it wasn't a chutter, so it was more full and I, I ran out. And mine was, I brought, it was amazing. I used like six pounds of meat in mine and I still ran out. <laughs> Yeah, that's good stuff. And it, having it there totally elevated it. It was just a completely different event. Mm -hmm. It was very, very cool. Had you been to it when it was here? Yes, once. Okay. That's the year my mom won for her chowder. Oh, right, yeah. Yep. So we were here once for that one. And it was tight. It was very tight. You were like squeezing in and out of it. <laughs> we were like trying to like, you finished eating, now move so yeah. more people <laughs> get out. <laughs> <laughs> Having a, de a generator on standby <laughs> in case mm -hmm. <laughs> we blew power. Yeah, and I remember that. That's just something. So we do have this in the book, in the budget book, under donations. The library. Yeah. It's all broke down. Mm-hmm. I didn't. Is see that it. from the town? I didn't. From the, the budget book that the town gave, it's under the donations tab. And and I, where I in that? I looked all that today. I didn't see it. It's oh. after. It's after Life Flight. And it says the Acton Public Library Board of Church Trees request 26. What, what's the page in front of it? <laughs> the page in front of it is Life Flight of Maine. Oh, I see. It's in those big chapters. Yeah. Yeah. So we do have it. That's okay. It's a one pager. Oh, but <laughs> we'll take it anyway. Take it anyway. <laughs> Silo today, I didn't see it. Nobody even commented I found my glasses. <laughs> well, I didn't find them, really, my wife did. Yeah, you wanna give me one of them for me? Thank you. You're welcome. No oh, worry, had one. Yes, I was Margarita, what's after it? Thank you, it's ladies. It's a one-pager. What's after it is Acton Shapley Youth Conservation Corps. Don't forget about that climate control down there for next okay. year, at least. It's a little over halfway, a little before three-quarters towards the end. Are we all set? We're we all are. set. If you have any other individual questions, feel free to email yeah. um, myself at the library. Yeah. We'll stop in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Rick. Smith. Mr. Rick. What department is he under? AKA here on the Fire Chief. Fire. And Public Safety. A whole bunch of other stuff. I have many titles. Right. I didn't know what they all were, Rick. That's why I didn't say them. Nope. Sometimes I just got a few extra surprise ones. <laughs> Before Rick gets going, <clears throat> there's a few new things that he's going to explain that he wants this year. Um, and if the Slutman holds true, and Rick can tell us if it's, he thinks it's going to, um, their last budget meeting uh, that they had, they were talking about. Uh, Instead of the five dollar an hour across the board, they were talking about a seven percent um, increase, um, and we're also looking at 
a medical di- medical director. Is that I'm using the right words, right? Yep. Medical medical director for next year. Um, It'll be this year, actually. We this are required year. by law to have it. Right, but in a budget for next year. Yes. Um, but those are the three major things, right? Right, the two pieces of equipment and the, and the medical director. And a market adjustment for the pay for my employees. Right. Now, what, what, go ahead, Rick. Yeah, the I'll floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, Warren Finance. My name is Rick Smith. I'm the chief of the Acton Fire Rescue Department. I'm here to talk to you guys tonight about budget. What I have in front of me is a letter that I sent to the select board that goes through line by line my requests. I'll skim over some of the boring ones and read you the more in-depth parts of the more detailed ones. We have all that, Rick. You have my letter? We can follow. I believe it is in here. Okay. Yes, the first page. Yep. Yep, the first page. Perfect. So, 501-1, I put in an inflation-based raise for myself just so that I didn't take a pay cut in the next budget. Uh, as inflation works that way. If you guys have any questions too, please, please, please ask. Okay, in in years before where I've done the budget, I've had people try to cut things from my budget because they didn't understand what they were. Uh, ask the question. I'm a subject matter expert. I've done, I've been employed with the town through fire rescue for 20 years. I have multiple degrees in this. Uh, it is my jam. All right. So ask me questions. I want to talk about. I can talk about fire. EMS and lifting until the cows come home. So I look old enough to have done this for 20 years. Thank you. Like that's honest. Like, they're going to say like 10 years, like 20 years. If you get closer, it becomes more apparent. <laughs> <laughs> you have to overlook the makeup, you mean? The gray. And, yeah. Somehow I don't have my dad's hairline, so it's still all up there. But ah. uh, A joke for those of you that know my dad. Uh, so yeah, basically I put in a, a 6% because that's what it was when I was doing budget. That's the kind of the downside of our town process. I have to submit my budget in January and then vote on it six months later and the world moves a lot faster than that. Mm. Uh, 501-2, so I allowed, I added in 10 hours per week for the deputy chief to work in the office to assist me with completing tasks for Act and Fire Rescue. There's just so much work to be done and the 20 hours a week that I'm putting in is just not really cutting it. I don't want any more hours myself. I'd actually like to divide the labor up because I think you'll get more efficiency out of that. I think any of you that have worked a a 40 hour week job on top of your other 40 hour a week job can understand that after a while, all the numbers start to go blurry. And so it's a little bit easier to pass that load on to somebody else. Uh, So Deputy Chief Ham would be, he does vehicle maintenance already. He'd be taking on building inspections for all the fire codes, working with the code enforcement office, uh, equipment upkeep, protective equipment allocation management. So he does a really good job already, uh, probably already putting in more than 10 hours a week. A lot of it, much Deputy Chief Ham comes from the same school that I do. Job first, pay second. And so the work gets done, but he's not always putting in for his hours, which I constantly hound him about. Uh, The second 10 hours a week is for my administrative assistant, uh, Cassie Dobson. She makes sure that all of the paperwork is in line, all the records are kept, everything is filed, so that the Bureau of Labor stays off our backs and the town and everybody else is happy with our compliance. So there's a lot of paperwork associated with all the work that we do. And so uh, admin assistant Dobson makes sure that I have all that stuff straight. She also keeps me on the straight and narrow. Uh, making sure that I get my paperwork done and things in and submitted and all that. So basically, I'm just looking for 10 hours a week for each of them to assist with keeping our fire rescue up and running. We have we have between 35 and 40 employees, depending on what time of day you ask me. And what uh, do they each get allotted now? Zero. Oh, they get zero hours for yeah. these particular tasks? Correct. Okay. So right now we have supervisory wages, which you see is 501 dash zero two which i have a certain amount of money in there but there's no allotted hours it's just as things come up they do them and put in for gotcha them. i'm looking to get them in the office in a seat 10 hours a week with the hopes of having some type of administrative level person there four to five days a week and that's only going to benefit the town more to have somebody there that can answer more questions and things like that mm-hmm. any questions on that line Good, seeing none, I'll continue. 
501-08 is the stipends paid. So stipends paid is what all the rest of the employees get paid for going to calls, not the per diems, but the, the people that come from home or, or wherever else. That's what they get paid for going on calls, attending meetings and trainings. And so we pay all of our people for all of the work that they do. And that line got adjusted to make up for the raises that I had suggested and had been increased to match where we've just come up short the last couple of years because we're getting busier and training more and becoming a more efficient department. And so we were, let me give you an exact number. This is, this is for the per diem people? No. No. Just call, call people. Meaning like? People like Caitlin. What's the difference? It's typing. Well, so I'll get into that. So we came up 1,800 short last year. So per diem people are paid to stay at the station 24 seven. Oh, those are your, okay. Stipends I thought that paid, I, I had it the other way around. Yep, right. Stipends paid goes out to my call people, those are the people that are on call. You know, okay. they got their pager, yep. they got their phone. Yeah. Okay. So not volunteer firefighters. We have no pure volunteers. Okay. Everyone is paid for the time that they put in. Okay. Um, if you've ever been a part of the any type of organization like this, they always put in about double what they actually get paid for. Yeah. But we try to compensate them for the hours they work, but you'll never make up for all the time that people just do right. stuff. So the people that work at the fire department that have 40 hours, they're considered per diem. Well, we no. split it. So, <laughs> okay. So, um, I'll get into that in a sure. little bit, yeah. and I'll, I'll be more than happy to explain everything. Rick, um, yeah. Can I ask a question? Uh, you basically just barely touched on it. What you do with the number of people you have? From we know we were the library. Mm -hmm. The growth has been incredible. Yeah. Um, what do you see between what you did last year, the year before? It, last year's always hard. COVID year, maybe we should just take it out or maybe leave it in because more people were home doing silly things like roasting marshmallows in the home fireplace. But do you see an increase, whether it be fire or rescue, uh, with the influx in town? Uh, over what you've done be in the past. Absolutely. We've gone up almost 100 calls a year. Uh, also, the employees that we're taking on, not, not the people that we're hiring full-time necessarily or the people that are coming to work per diem, but the call people mm -hmm. are, are coming in with no experience. And so we've got to train them and we've got to pay for their training and things like that. There's benefits to, to come into work for us. Um, and so the costs of putting on those trainings and making sure the people are keeping their skills up along with new hazards constantly being sent to us, right? So COVID was not something that I could have predicted. Had I, I would not have taken the chief's position. Okay? <laughs> One year of being the chief under my belt and I'm in a pandemic was not exactly the way I wanted to start my chief time, but it's, it's what happened, right? And so as we go through these things, we constantly are facing new threats. We're constantly having to deal with new problems that we've never dealt with before. Uh, I've been, like I said, I've been on the fire department for 20 years. I've been at the fire department my entire life. Uh, I don't remember a time when I got a phone call at the fire station before where it was like, hey, I just moved up here. How does this wood stove thing work? And I was like, don't touch it. I'll be right over. Yeah, it's here. It's here. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome how to use a wood stove. Right. And so I grew up in around, I grew up in Acton. So I know how to use wood stove. I know how to go from tree to, you know, cooking anything on the wood stove. That's also just... what I think I would call. Like, <laughs> how do I use my wood stove? No. So, right. And I suppose it's better than trying to YouTube it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But we're getting a big influx of people, you know, from away. And so, yeah, we're going to have a, an increase in just people moving to town. So they're going to be more medicals and more requests for service and things, things like that. And then we're seeing an influx of people that are new to wood stoves and new to rural living. And so we've seen an influx of chimney fires and fire related issues, smoke stoves, things like that. And so it's important that we maintain or continue to grow along with the town so we can make sure that we maintain good fire and EMS response to keep the people safe. Gotcha. Do you have a rough breakdown of, as to the what calls you take? I mean, like what percentage do you have fire? What percentage? Medical? Absolutely. So every year I release that on our website and I release it on Facebook 
Mm -hmm. um, I don't have them in front of me, but if you wanted to pull up uh, actonfirerescue.org, it is on the page. It'll be on there? Yep. Yeah. So I've what, seen you post it on Facebook, in, too. I mean, just I mean, in, in a rough thing, what, what are most of your calls? Are they, they're most, most of our calls are medical. Yep, we do mostly medical calls. Okay. And that's, I mean, we know that our main, in general, population is aging, right? And so we're dealing with more and more medical calls. And, and changes to society as a whole. You know, people are better now about calling the ambulance when they're having a problem versus, you know, maybe back in Dennis's day, they just took two shots of whiskey and wrote it out, okay? <laughs> they're realizing that maybe I'm having a heart attack and maybe I should call 911 and we can get them up to Main Med rapidly and get a stent placed and we can save their life. Or you could do both. <laughs> you could do, you could get a little of that. Um, uh. So, <laughs> still acting. Um, and I'm still Dennis. And Dennis is still here. <laughs> I see your post on Facebook from January 6th for your 2021 acting fire rescue emergency calls. Yep. And so you'll see it's predominantly. In the breakdown, yep. yep. I imagine you spend a fair amount of time helping other agencies on calls. So that changes from year to year. So in the last year, it was a large majority of our calls because the towns around us were not able to support their own calls at all. Uh, any call that's larger than a simple medical call. So we have we rate our medical calls from alpha to echo. I, they do go to omega, but that is it's a moot point so they go from alpha to echo all right and so your alpha bravos are like a nausea vomiting or maybe i've got some back pain or something like that your charlie deltas are like i feel lightheaded or things a little bit more serious and then your i mean your delta calls are like difficulty breathing chest pain things like that echo is cardiac arrest so somebody having echo level medical is in cardiac arrest their heart is stopped and we're going to go attempt to, to restart it uh your alpha bravo charlie and most of your Delta calls take between two to four people to resolve. Uh, so that's pretty simple. Our echo medical calls work a lot better with eight to 10, just because CPR is arduous and, and can really wear down the crews pretty quickly. And as they become tired, their CPR gets worse and high quality CPR is the best way to save someone's mm -hmm. life, which is we'll come to later in the discussion. So. When we talk about anything else, we're talking about building fires or major car wrecks or anything like that, yeah, we've all got to work together. Because in the days when Acton Fire Rescue started, they had you know a core group of three to 10 people, and that grew as big as 50, as far as I remember, and those were all called. People all came from home. And a lot of people worked in town, and when a call came in, they put down their hammers or plow or whatever they were doing, and they went on the call and they handled it. That doesn't exist now. We have a you, very- you budget for such a thing, not, I mean, how does that, your, your time get paid for if you go to Shapley for a big fire? So we, we have a mutual aid agreement. And so what we have all agreed to, everybody in the county and the surrounding counties have all agreed that I'll help you and you help me. And most of the time it works out. Mm -hmm. We ran into an incident recently uh, in the last year, once with Lebanon and, and with Shapley, where like Shapley is the most recent one, we went there to cover 70 of their medical calls and they helped us with four. And so we said, okay, at this point, it's not mutual aid anymore we need to start billing you. And we put that in place to make up for those costs because it's not fair to you, taxpayer, to pay for Shapley's non-ambulance coverage, right? But for the most part, like if we have a large fire in Acton, Shapley sends an engine and a tanker and all their help over. And if Shapley has a fire, we send an engine and a tanker, whatever they request, over to them and help them. And so that's mutual. We really bail each other out. Budgeting is not an issue for that. Correct, because the cost really balances itself out. Yeah. Um, I sit and as, as you can probably see, I crunch through all those numbers and, and calculate everything out. And that's how I adjust things from year to year based on trends. I'm a big data nerd. I'm a, it was a really nice pie chart. I'm a big that. nerd. <laughs> nice chart. Thank you. Uh, and so I try to calculate all this stuff out, but it's, you know, I don't have a magic ball. <laughs> okay. If I did, my job would be way easier because <laughs> I would just park the ambulance next to your house right before you had the heart attack and then yeah, we'd we'll just scoop you up. Crystal ball. <laughs> yeah, it would make my job so much easier. So Ricky, what's response time generally? Uh, it depends on where you live in town, right? So oh, I know, I know. Because the last time we had to call you for my neighbor, yep. it seemed like it took forever, although it, I mean, it, at, at that particular point, I mean, I was afraid for my neighbor. Yeah. And uh, so my sense of time was 
probably not. You're suffering from 911 time dilation. Uh, are we a long town and not a wide? Correct. We're very long, right? Yes. Okay. Yep. Our fire station very luckily happens to be in the middle for the moment. This is why I would live here. Yeah. It's a long town. <laughs> uh, and you're just one little uh, 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 Some people think that I think that was awful. Place. So you're in 911 time dilation, <laughs> right? I've had to call 911 for family before. I've been first on scene for a building fire where I'm standing there with just my pickup truck, which does us, you know, zero good at putting the fire out. And I've had to wait for the fire trucks to show up. So I completely understand. When you go back and pull the numbers, they're not that bad. So like the far reaches, like up where you are, where it's kind of tricky to get to, we're still under 10 minutes we're eight minutes yeah. and that is a hundred percent because we continue to staff the fire station you have to have those people there because before what it would be was i would if the call's at your house i would leave my house and it's four minutes from my house to the four to six depending on who i get stuck behind from my house <laughs> to the fire station right take all my stuff out carry it into the station put it all on the appropriate vehicle then take that vehicle and drive it all the way out there, which, you know, we don't have any four lane highways and fire trucks are big and slow. And so we go all the way out to the call and then we resolve the call. Because we have people there, as soon as 911 call comes in and the dispatcher puts in the call type, so medical, fire, whatever it is, and the address, it gets sent to our cell phones now. So as soon as that call comes in, my crews are up, they're in the truck, and they start driving to that address before they even know what the call is because they know that there is a medical call you know up off langley shores so they're going to get in and they're going to start driving the ambulance to langley shores and that saves time we've been working on these systems to shrink the amount of time from when you call 911 until i show up at your door and say hey what's the problem uh, but that is a hundred percent because we pay people to stay at the fire station okay Hmm. Yeah, like I said, I mean, it's. I know that my my sense of time was off. Yeah, and that's why I asked about. And it people has have, to be. It has to be. People yeah. have called before and been like, "What took you so long?" It's like, "Hey, after the call's done, we can go and I'll pull the numbers and I will show you." And I've shown them the numbers and maybe they believe me, maybe they didn't. I pulled the tapes and we've listened to the audio, which is all tracked and dialogued out. And it, you know, we're we're right on because we we follow a quality assurance process where we review all of our runs to make sure that we're within timely fashions trust me if there was a time where the call was dispatched and my crew was not out the door in less than two minutes we're having a chat i set very rigorous standards for everybody that works over there and they meet them Rick. training and repetition and these i i actually know a lot about what you're talking about 23 years ago i was on rescue when it was volunteer mm -hmm. and like you a lot of times you could be at a house in your car you know when it was like oh, burn baby burn or you know one person can't do a rescue and and that was i can remember a time when true story i had a, a roofer have a heart attack at least working on my roof that was not a pleasant thing he did survive but i heard because they had to have a rule no one could go to the site when they were alone you had to first go to the fire department wait for the person who could drive then you all went in group that was not a 10 minute response right but it was the safest response actually if you knew what was going on yeah. and we but, streamlined that process yeah but so the thing don't. is now do all when you're fired you say you, you know you're going to langley shore mm -hmm. and it's your fire truck that probably is going to go out the door first are your all your firefighters uh emts Yes. They, if oh, they're, that's good. That's if they're good. working a shift, yeah. we have a tiered system of how, who, how we fill shifts. Okay. So we fill all of our shifts on, on the best circumstances with a firefighter two mm -hmm. paramedic in one slot, and then a firefighter two EMT or advanced EMT in the second slot. Now, I don't always have 100% compliance with that because there's not people knocking down my door to work there and go through the training and everything else that needs to happen to do that. But we create as many as we can. And I pull from surrounding communities as much as I can to, to be able to do that. But almost all of the people that work over there are fire and EMS. We have two 
three. We have three that are EMS only. One of them is testing for fire one and two again. Dennis will be very familiar. And the other two are currently in firefighter training. They will be done in June. Uh, and then I have four fire only, and they've all were EMTs previously and just got tired of the EMS life, which I can understand. I'll probably get there someday myself, although I don't know. I really do like it. Um, and so they just want to be firefighters, and that's fine. We'll still take the help. But other than that, everyone is cross-trained, and so they do whatever job needs to be done. That's wonderful. Uh, that's getting the best bang for your buck, right? We don't have enough people to do all the jobs, and so I have to make sure that everybody can do all the jobs. Mm. And are paid properly to do all the jobs. Which is leading me <laughs> to my next topic. 501-20 and 30. I'm going to read you my statement I read to the select board in case you didn't watch the video. Following the changes to the industry, as part of the most recent pandemic, we need to make drastic changes to the rate of pay for all our employees. We have seen sweeping increases to pay across the county, which has made the market for staff even more competitive. We already do not have enough fire and EMS personnel in the state to fill all the jobs that exist. This has led to different departments competing for people to fill those roles. We at Acton Fire Rescue have worked hard to find some of the best personnel, along with training new people, to ensure the residents of Acton's needs are met when they call 911. To ensure that Acton does not fall into the dire circumstances of the towns around us, we will need to continue to offer good rates of pay, and therefore I have requested $5 an hour for all positions other than mine. To offset this large cost, I have suggested that the funds be used from ARPA to be used to be used to given raises needed this year, but spread the cost of taxpayers over the next four years for all hourly shift employees and call people. And I presented the select board with a plan on how we would phase that in with a zero impact this year and then a phase in three year impact, so four years total uh, going forward. I believe all the Warren Finance Committee is uh, with that schedule, right? Yeah. It is not cheap. I understand that it will be a large impact to the community, but understand also that our services make a large impact to the community. And currently, my firefighter EMTs, who minimum requirement 120 hours to get their basic EMT license with 52 hours of continuing education every three years, and a 233 hour firefighter one and two course, are making $17 an hour, which is less than what the town currently pays someone to do traffic control. Wow. And Ray, so... Can, before you get my throw on this, Ray is saying... I'm very passionate about this. Dennis. You should be. Well, as you well remember, a year ago, me standing up at town meeting and trying to increase the pay for the people that work over there. Um, why now? Why am I asking for it now? And not last year. Last year, I had to ask for other things. We needed to get the tanker. We needed to get the generator. Or the tanker was second payment in. We needed to get the generator. I asked for some raises and things like that, and they got cut in the process prior to us meeting. Mm. This year, with the ARP funds, which can be designated for pay increases for essential employees, which I fire and EMS fall well within, I thought this was a great opportunity for the town to do a market adjustment mm -hmm. to make their fire and EMS positions paid appropriately based on the other surrounding towns, of which I polled almost every town in York County and half of Cumberland County in a collective effort with the other fire chiefs. Their current pay is close to some of our current pay, but when the fire chiefs of all, all the fire chiefs of York County meet uh, monthly, except in the two months of summer when it's really nice and then we take them off, all basically said that we would be shooting for approximately the same raises. We would all end up about the same number, mm. which is a good place to be because if anybody jumps too far ahead of the other one, they start stealing from other people, sure. right? Some of our per diem ranks are made up of people that don't live in Acton. They have no investment in Acton. They came here to work because we create a good work environment. We give them a good station to work in and we paid a fair wage. 
that fair wage has dropped off because the market for labor has changed. I could quit my job as fire chief right now and go make more money driving truck, okay? And I do have a CDL. But I care about the town and I'll probably never leave. I'll probably get buried in this uniform in this town at some point. <laughs> Would your truck still be red? Yes. Okay. Okay. I still get a, I get a little beacon on top, so I still like feel like I was in a fire truck. Okay. But not everybody just, feels like that. Just to give a, an example, and the personal part of it, I'm not going to get into. I have no idea what the reasons are, but a year ago, I don't think we lost them completely, but. We had one of our top ambulance people uh, take a job down to Sanford Boat. And, and this goes back to me arguing uh, before. Uh, she wasn't even making $20 an hour here working here. Yeah. And the hours, the training that this person went through uh, when she started the last year, the amount of hours is just incomprehensible to me. Yeah. And I think it's very sad. And there probably was other reasons why she did it. But what I'm saying, it's sad when somebody is given that many years of commitment that has that much training and that qualified, because uh, she's qualified to do anything that had to be done, that we lost them. Right. And, and I think it's and it was pay and benefits. Thing. It was a hundred percent pay and benefits, <clears throat> and will continue to be a place of turnover where we will constantly bring in new people, and they will leave to go to places with better pay and better benefits unless we change something. The town pays to train them, and then another place takes them away mm -hmm. once their contracts up. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's because been an across the board problem here. Cheaper to pay them up front, good, and keep them. Well, and the thing is, if they go to school, the towns too. Yep. That's very if nice. they go to school for this stuff, yeah, you know, even if we're not paying for it, is a time. If they're just doing it on their own, Rick, you went through the amount of hours of training you have to have to. That's for the lowest level of training that you we know. Take. What I mean, it, it, it's it's amazing. Let me give you. Let me give you. Let me give you. What our firefighter permit is, so the firefighter is the same, it's 233 hours, right? So they need to do the EMT basic, which is 120 hours. And then there's two ways they can do this. So they either go basic EMT, advanced EMT, and then paramedic, which is the way that I went. So I took a 120 hour course, and then I worked for a couple of years as an EMT. Then I took a 350 hour course to work as an advanced EMT, and worked a couple of years in that. And then I took a 1200 hour course and uh, it's not included on here, but I, it was an additional 760 hours of clinical rotation. So I mm -hmm. worked in an ambulance in another community. I worked in the ER, the ICU, surgery. I delivered some babies. Uh, oh. Disgusting and beautiful at the same time. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> For anybody that's seen it. Um, no thanks. It's, it's a lot a lot of time and you don't do it because it sounds like it's fun right you do it because it's a passion but a passion doesn't buy me milk <laughs> a passion definitely doesn't put gas in my tank right now okay so we've got to compensate these people for the work and i'm not even talking about all the other stuff right so we make them go to pumps that's a whole weekend 16 hours gone we make them take evoc another 16 hour course an entire weekend of theirs gone all right and obviously we don't hold those classes in the winter so they're losing a weekend in the summer just to do that that doesn't include we train at the fire rescue every month for two hours on the second monday we train quarterly ems trainings so four to eight hours depending on what i'm putting on and then on the opposite end of the next quarter rotated forward we do fire training again four to eight hours depending on what we're doing we ask a lot of these people and we pay them for their time but and we can all agree there's no amount of money i'm going to pay somebody to take time away from their family or their kids that's going to make up for that right i grew up in that life my dad was dedicated to the fire department through and through. And there were many sporting events or things that I went to that my dad was not present for because he was giving his time to, to fire an EMS. But I can at least make sure that at the end of the week, my people can pay their bills, they can pay their rent, they can afford to live in this community. 
because right now I'm pulling people from further and further away because of prices increasing in the town. They can't afford to buy homes here anymore. I'd much rather have my full-time firefighter paramedics who are trained up to their nostrils in everything to do when things go bad live two minutes away from work instead of two hours. Because all of these people are passion driven. And so like our newest, one of our newest full-time employees, uh, paramedic Mary Casper lives in Sanbornville and comes back for every large incident, comes back for all the fires and things like that. That's not a requirement of her job. It's the passion that brings her back, okay? And so if we can make it so that these people can live in these communities, it's only gonna benefit us. We're getting more bang for our buck. How many employees do you have? I have myself part-time. I have three full-time employees. I have about 15 or so per diems. Half of those per diems are also on my call department. So they, they live close enough to, to go on calls that are close. And I've got about 15 um, call people. So that, that flexes all the time because some people step down, some people join up. It kind of changes from month to month depending on as people move, especially with the housing market. We, we actually just lost an employee because they couldn't, couldn't buy anything around here. Uh, they had to move away. So. so you're fully staffed? Yeah. Yeah, we're not currently hiring anybody. I would still take call members, and usually we do a recruitment system in the spring, which we'll, we'll put out again for. But the last uh, two times that we did it, we got one person out of both times. Mm -hmm. Where do the 411 calls go, or the 911? 911 calls go to Sanford. That's the closest PSAP center, unless you're or Leslie and lives on the New Hampshire border and hits in the Hampshire town. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it really depends where you live. Uh, then they get directed to the 911 center in Sanford and are dispatched from there. We have a contract for Sanford on that, right? Yep. Right. Yep. Yeah. We're in a we're in a group of eight or nine communities that all participate. Yeah, that's, that's what I was thinking. Yep, and I, I am the rep that um, covers this area for all the <coughs> rural communities. Yeah. So it's more cost effective to have the 911 call go to Sanford and then get transferred. Yeah. What's the time span when a call comes in to 911 from and wherever it goes? So it all depends on the type of call. So they do, it's priority based processing so if you call up and you say i'm having a heart attack i'm having chest pain it goes out within less than a minute if you call up and you're like well my toe kind of hurts they're going to start asking you more questions and it'll take a little bit longer but obviously if you're just having toe pain it's not as big of an emergency as if you're having a heart attack uh, if you call up and say oh my house is on fire they're going to say what's your address and they're going to just start us and then they'll start asking you more questions but we're already headed towards your house. Mm -hmm. If you call up and say, yeah, a tree fell through my house, they're gonna say, well, are there wires involved? Is there leaking? Is it anybody hurt? You know, they're gonna go through more questions. I'm not a dispatcher, just, but they're gonna ask more questions before they dispatch the call. So I can't give you an answer of like, it's always less than a minute. It really depends on the call. And well, how helpful the person. And they have to transfer you to Maine. Yeah. <laughs> it also depends on they, how helpful. they did to me. <laughs> yeah, which is frustrating, trust me. I've. I've that, been there. That should only, does that only happen when you make it through a cellular call? Correct. If you're, was, you're going the towers wow. in New Hampshire. You're right. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, and we, I, was, be, I was calling on a cell phone because right. we don't have a landline anymore. Right, yep. but a landline wouldn't have that issue. No, and you're up off Great East, so you're going to hit in the Hampshire Tower because of, like, Goat Hill and all that. You're going to hit in the Hampshire Tower well before you hit a main yeah, tower. You see it, yeah. Right, and so... The tower goes, I'm in New Hampshire. This person must be in New Hampshire. And so it yeah. sends you to New I Hampshire. Can see, I can see center. the tower right across the lake. Yep. Gotcha. But a landline. Landline goes straight goes in. Goes straight into Sanford. Yeah. And we've been going yeah. through the dispatch in Sanford. Since county now? closed. Eight years. Longer than that. Thirteen, something like that. Really? Yeah. yeah. Because we used to go out through Gray. And that was. Uh, Very short time. That was didn't work out well for nope. any, any of other times. No. So that's why we changed. Uh, yeah, and prior to that, we were through county, which was based yeah, in Alfred. Yeah. And that was just closed, so, yeah. And the state police one just plain didn't work. They're not, it's a different type of dispatching to dispatch us than it is police, really. So. I'm just yeah, bringing so. that up so everybody no, understands. Yeah, I'm why here to answer why questions. Why we are where we are. Yeah, I'm here to answer questions. Um, any questions on the pay stuff? I know I've talked at length about it. <laughs> Of course, the board can always request me back. Just give me plenty of warning. I do. I still work full time. 
in Sanford, and this is part time for me. I own a business. I'm married, so try to give me some ah. some leeway. <laughs> I, I, the wages, I guess, were ahead of. You got any strong indication from the slotmen what they're going to do with this? I had been told that they were sniffing around the seven percent thing, and I. This is what they said. Their budget. Mm -hmm. Greatly offended at the idea that they would not even entertain a discussion to go above that number. Yeah. Seven percent for a firefighter per uh, firefighter EMT was like a dollar twenty nine. Uh, which again, when you're giving a raise based on the current amount of inflation, if you give the same raise as inflation, that's not a raise. Correct. That's, right. that's just it's keeping ketchup. up with ketchup. Yeah. Correct. It's ketchup. Yeah. And we need to make a market adjustment to adjust our firefighter EMTs up to a pay scale that matches the area departments so that we're not losing people. To Go keep him one. here. Correct. He or she here. Our people here, yeah. because we've got good people. I've got a great team. It makes my job so much easier. So for the most happen? part, I stay out of their way. <laughs> I let them a do good the leader. They're good, exactly. Right. The Slutmen have talked about a, a wage base raise, but then they're they're married. Seem to be married to this seven percent, which. And what would be the percentage that you're looking for? I asked for five dollars across the board because that would be the market adjustment to match everything up. And that that so would be different, right? Percentage Depending on the job. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Well, for our, our firefighter EMT would be making $22 an hour. Again, this is a person that's done hundreds and hundreds of hours of school who can go in burning buildings and pump and drive fire trucks and save your life if you're having a medical. And then our firefighter paramedics, which is a lot more school, is going to be making $26 an hour. I don't think these are astronomical wages for highly trained professionals in their field. Right. right but it's a lot more than the 7% the selectmen are talking about. Correct. So there's a huge gap there. There is a huge gap there. So what I would like to know, I guess, is the Warren Finance Committee, right? And the fire chief, <clears throat> you know my feeling about the wages. Mm -hmm. I've been very clear, especially the last year, the last two years. All the Warren Finance Committee can do is make a recommendation on what the slot may give us. Yep. Um, I would like to see the process changed. Uh, I would like to see on the Warren article, for example, um, this is the fire chief's recommendation, this is the slotman's recommendation, this is the Warren Finance Committee's recommendation. And I, and I think the articles should be written. This is just me been doing this for 50 years. I think the articles should be written so that the town meeting can decide which one of those three recommendations they want, if they're not the same. If, if, if. I know it's rare, Dennis, but I'll agree with you. Oh, man. <laughs> because I'm right I, want, I, I approach all of this stuff from a business perspective, right? My business is saving lives and property. I want to provide what you pay me for, right? So if you want the best service available, you're going to have to pay for it, mm -hmm. right? And if you're okay with nobody showing up to your home when it's on fire, there's communities in Maine you can move to because their fire and rescue services have closed because there's no people and they didn't want to pay people to be there. I'm not kidding you. There are fire departments that have closed within the last year. Closed. Nobody comes to your house when it's on fire. That's terrifying to me. County? In your county, no. But upper Maine. parts of Maine, yes. You get up, you get up north a little yep. bit. Mm -hmm. And there were, there were ambulance services that closed in 2021 because of restrictions, changes, things like that. Rules are just so tight. The rule, we've got to be, currently, we don't have to be vaccinated for all the stuff. We will probably be after June. All of my employees are cap, uh, vaccinated against COVID-19. Um, as requirements and restrictions increase, it is harder and harder to find people. Whether you believe where you stand on that, yeah. we can debate outside of this meeting, but it's gonna, I get less and less people as we have higher and higher restrictions. Sure. And I'm pretty, outside I'm pretty sure the restrictions are a little higher than they were when your grandfather was chief. Yeah, quite a bit so. And I set some pretty high restrictions too, but 
my people understand why and I justify and talk to all of them and there's not a single restriction that I require that I don't do myself. So like we do a physical agility test every year and I take the test every year. So if the Warren Finance Committee, and I'm not talking for everybody, I'm just talking about myself. If, say if the slotmen decide they're gonna put forward a uh, 7% increase, how do you and other people encourage them to go with a five dollar increase across the board before fight for that. before we have to vote on it because if they only put your seven percent increase we can't vote to make it more correct you know as far as the warren finance committee is concerned correct so that i think you i've been thinking about this issue since i caught wind of what their intentions were and i i fault none of them personally i understand they're doing what they think is best for the town um I think that the best course of action would be for the citizens, the taxpayers as individuals, speak to their select board as a taxpaying individual and voice their concern. Um, I, as the entire time that I've been fire chief, have only asked for just what I need. I've never gone and said, well, give me $10 an hour because I'm going to know you knocked me back to five. Right. I come to you with just what I want. Yep. I'm a Mainer through and through. I don't want anything extra. I don't want any pizzazz. No. I'm just asking for what I need. Please give me what I need, and I'll keep doing a good job. And you won't you won't hear from us, right? So um, that's all I can figure. I can't say much. I'm an employee of this board. Well, but you, you, you are you are rare, can do But I'm going to tell you something, and I'll say this here. I'll say it. In Washington, D.C., I don't care where the heck I say it. Uh, you're more than an employee. And I understand you're under the auspices, uh, the guidance, or whatever you want to call it, the Board of Selectmen. But there's a hot, lot higher level than that is who you are. You're not just an employee. Not in my, not in, in my mind. You're the fire chief. You're the one that runs the fire and, and, and EMS, and you do a huge service to the community. And myself personally, I've never looked at you as an employee. And as a fire chief, you should be a feel free to sit in this room and say whatever you want to say as fire chief without restrictions, whether some you are working for somebody or whether you're not. That, that, that's all I'm going to say. Yep. Well, if I can add to that, Dennis, um, just so people know, um, I, have, I, I do happen to know, but Rick, I'd like you to share it. Tell us exactly what your education is. And then before the education, I realize you were born with firefighter boots on, you know, with grandfather and father and all that. But uh, when did you start this journey? Sure. So I joined Acton Fire Department when it was Acton Fire Department in 2001. I was 14 years old. Um, since then, I, I was part of Acton Ambulance Association when that existed. I've been a part of Acton Fire Rescue since its inception in, in 2017. I am, let's see if I can do it in order. Uh, firefighter 1 and 2, Fire Instructor 1 and 2, Fire Officer 1 and 2, NIMS 1, 2, 3, 4, 700 compliant, um, Pumps 1, never took Pumps 2. Uh, EVOC, I'm a state fire instructor, I'm a state licensed instructor coordinator. I have an associate's degree from Southern Maine Community College in Fire Science. I have a bachelor's degree from the University of Southern Maine in Applied Technical Leadership. I'm currently working on my master's degree in public administration with a concentration in emergency management. Um, I've taken a lot of different classes. I was, I'm a full-time Firefighter paramedic, a lieutenant on the ladder truck for the city of Sanford and have been since 2009. I worked for Wells EMS for 13 years. I got up to the level of deputy director uh, there. I was a QA coordinator for North Berwick Rescue. I've been an instructor for Main State F the Fire Service Institute. I've been an instructor for Main EMS. Um, I don't know, I'm starting to run out of things. I've done lots of stuff. 
So you're uh, a little bit qualified. Yeah, personal yeah. trainer, yeah. Uh, strongman <laughs> certified. I'm the three times strongest man in Maine. And now, now, uh, now, now you're bragging. <laughs> 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 you know, come on now, no, no. But the point. You asked him to brag. <laughs> well, no, the point is, you are qualified what you are speaking about i consider myself a subject matter expert and when in areas that i'm not i know how to get all the ones that are thank you that's what makes people successful correct it's not a one person show i come up here and you guys get to interact with me a lot uh, you think that i put out the world's greatest fire department i am one tiny cog in a giant machine that makes sure everybody in this community stays safe my entire officer corps uh, deputies and captains, my full-time staff, my per diem staff, my call staff. It's a lot. The, the fire rescue here is built on the strong backs of a lot of people. And all I'm doing with this budget this year is making sure those people are paid. Years ago. You're humble at that. Years ago, <laughs> when I worked at the school, when Ricky, at one time, he wasn't very big, you know. Okay. <laughs> Uh, his grandfather was fire chief. Mm. Myself and Ted Kreisat worked at the school. Well, they thought it would be a good idea if we went down to um, the Girl Scout camp and do some of this training at night to get somebody out of the building. Uh, we both worked at the school. and. Uh, I don't know if I dragged Ted out, if he dragged me out or what. Uh, but when I got all done, I says, you know something? I'll do the rat. I'll do this, I'll work on the roads. I, uh, firefighting isn't for me. <laughs> and uh, it, from personal experience, it, it takes a special person. And I don't, think, I don't think a lot of people in town really understand what, what it entails. My father was a volunteer fireman. And uh, follow the town in upstate New York where the, that's all we had was volunteers. And, um, you know, the, the whistle would go off and off he'd go. And, um, I mean, it's, and they weren't trained really well back then. And, you know, they lost, you know, they had one fire where they lost a number of, number of guys who went in to save someone. And uh, my dad was done at that point. He was like, he goes, I can't do this anymore because... It's just too much. Yeah. No. And, and you know, that, that, is always, that story has always stayed with me. You know, and I appreciate the things that we have uh, and the training that you guys have to go through. And As usual, I, when I, and everybody's been on here long enough now to know that I always have a story about something. <laughs> and just about. Uh, so let's let's move on to the, yeah. the, the two things the, you the two things that you want. Right? Yeah, we'll go uh, line by line. The rest of the stuff is just increases that are required, or you know, yeah. our cell phone plan went up, so I got to increase the phone line, yeah. things like that. So the two pieces of equipment that I'm requesting through our funding, the first one is called a um, uh, Lucas device. It replaces the people doing the compressions during a cardiac arrest or supplements them, I should say. They still have to do mm -hmm. compressions for two minutes and then the device can be applied. The nice part about the machine is it'll do it for 45 minutes. It doesn't take a break. You don't have to feed it. It doesn't need to pee, okay? <laughs> you just gotta change the batteries out every 45 minutes, which 45 minutes is a, is a long cardiac arrest. Yeah. Um, uh, that's, so these are quotes you provided here? Yep. Okay. Yep. Again, because of our governmental process, I've had to get quotes in January. I don't find many vendors that'll give me a quote for greater than six months. So those quotes will hopefully still be good, but we've seen how that goes year I'll to year. I'll be good with you this year. Those of you that have been on Warren Finance. <laughs> I'll be good with you this year. <laughs> uh, the, other, the other one is the power load system. So what that does is it's an arm that comes out of the back of the ambulance attaches to the stretcher and so when it attaches to the stretcher it holds the weight of the stretcher up we are able to bring the legs up and then slide the patient in currently what we have to do is physically lift the patient and the stretcher hit the retract legs button 
the legs come up and then we have to push the person into the ambulance while holding them. It works great on a perfectly sunny, dry day in the middle of summer on a flat parking lot. It's a little more complicated in acting. <laughs> <laughs> so having this device is a lifesaver and a back saver and anybody that follows workers comp things is gonna probably save us money down the road. We've yeah. been lucky so far, knock on wood, but uh, there's an opportunity for us to use some grant funding to better our EMS service, which is one of the highest intentions of ARP funding. Yep. And so I want to use that. A little quote on that one. Yeah. I mean, it is what it is. I mean, you can't wait the price is that now. I mean, it is what it is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know. He's the third strongest man in Maine. Does yeah, but really I can't go on every call. Lift <laughs> you still go pick, on every call. He's still going to pick me up. Uh, Rick, I thank you for that. Um, if anybody has any other questions, Ricky's still here. Yeah, I'd like to, as a medical director, is that mandatory from the state or the federal government? or is State. That state. Maine EMS, who oversees our licensing, both as individuals and as a service. Uh, mandated that we have a medic our own medical director. Is that just for acting or is that statewide? All towns. Is all, all ambulance services. Is this something new within the last year? Yep. Yep. Became became effective January 1st. We're outside that window a little bit, but Main EMS has given us some grace to get the paperwork straightened is, out. Does this come through the legislature or does this come through some state uh, so there's two boards that oversee it. There's the main EMS board and the MDPN, which is the main director or directors practitioners board, a board of doctors that oversee all the care that we give. Uh, they put together the rules. We have input. Sometimes they listen, sometimes they don't. Uh, and then they put out what the rules and laws for main EMS will be. They change them like every three years. And so before we had like a big umbrella medical director who we never interacted with or got anything from, but we also didn't pay anything for. Now we've got our own medical director. Um, and like I said, we're just down to the point of the two groups signing the contract. And this one will be a lot more interactive, helping us with training, reviewing calls, giving like medical advice, things like that, to just increase our, our care for what we provide. Will that be inclusive of other towns for the medical director? No, there's, we'll share. The, the one we're in talks with, we'll share with seven other communities, but we'll be working as a, as a collective to improve it kind of across the board. What's the level of their education? They're an emergency room physician, uh, practicing paramedic, uh, army vet. He's a pretty, I, I can't say those words. He's a cool guy. I was gonna. <laughs> <laughs> the, the doc that we're in talks with has helped us prior and has done some really cool stuff that you'd only see on TV to save some lives in this town. And nice. So nice. It's, uh, Rick, there was, working with there was some talk. Um, I, I'm sorry, I don't recall if it was either at a selectman's meeting or at a workshop where this director, I think it was confusing, would actually go out on a call yeah. to work work the call yeah so or we to that language from the contract or or to observe what the firefighters were doing um I, that i thought was a bit so that language is pulled from the contract okay. because that's not part of their job as a medical director at any point if i wanted to bring them on as a call firefighter paramedic because the doctor actually is certified <laughs> paramedic and a trained firefighter uh I could, because I have the ability to do that as a fire chief under state law. And on the other hand, if a medical director was out there and he saw something going on, I as cannot imagine he'd stand there and say, I think this guy needs a little, anybody want to do some, you know, compressions doctor, or something? They have the ability to do anything that falls under their license. Yeah. So. yeah. And it is a stipend, is it not? For the medical direction part. Right. So we've got to split the two. Well, that's where I'm, what I'm getting to. That's the complicated paperwork stuff that I have to deal with. Okay. The end user, you, the patient, will receive top care. I think it's only complicated, Rick, if it's made complicated. Right. When you explained it, I thought it was pretty simple. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. So ensuring this medical director within seven communities, each community is sharing the cost of having him come on. Correct? It divides it up a little bit, yeah. 
Okay. I'm looking at your uh, insurance. Fire department insurance, 502-04. Yep. Um, that's personal insurance for your people? I don't set any of that. That all comes from the treasurer. Understandable. But I, w I would think that uh, insurance for people that run into danger is a bit higher. Well, we... <laughs> so, our insurance is the same for uh, basically the whole town. We're all under... For, like, workers' comp and stuff like that, that's MMA. Okay. So, it falls under the same. And then, per, like, insurance rates like like health insurance aren't higher because of my occupation than they would be for you my life insurance probably would be if i had a private plan but and you and your workman's comp oh yeah a workman's comp set of like cross it it's dependent on how many benefits. cases you've had not the work that you do oh because if we talk about fatalities no, 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 no. much more dangerous right <laughs> yeah. right what, what they do honestly i've been part of all this yeah is for example a secretary but you're paying for a workman's comp percentage on that secretary won't be the same as you was paying a uh, machine operator. Yeah. My understanding is that based on your number of claims. Right, and that's... I, I'm, I'm telling you. Well, that's what causes the so increase. So they take your, they take, they have like an acceptable number of claims per year per employee, size department, blah, 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 blah. Then they take if you're higher above above that or lower well, than that. Well, then they jump it up. Then right. they jump They'll it jump up. it up. Yeah. And so that's why at Acton Fire Rescue, we have a health and fitness system, we have a gym, we have all these things in place to prevent injuries. That's why we're going for the power load. That's why we're going for the Lucas device. We're trying to remove the human factors from things that we can. There will always be humans in fire and EMS because even eventually the robot, the, you'll never replace the ability for somebody to make that split decision, right? And so we're going to remove the human factors from things we can and we're going to safety buffer the parts that we can't. I mean, two years ago, this was a huge discussion between the road commissioners and the slotmen over the levels of weapons comp mm -hmm. and what you had to pay for dependent. When I worked at the school, for example, obviously the highest risk down there were the janitors. You know, they worked at the school. It wasn't the secretaries or the teachers or the ed techs. Uh, and there is, you're right, there is a flat rate for certain levels, and then it changes when it gets up here. And, Unless something's changed in the last year or two, you know, there is a bigger risk. And you pay a higher rate with a bigger risk. Good. Does anybody else have any questions for me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Um, 50353, fire equipment. Yep. And then you got 50541, equipment repairs. Is that the same equipment that we're looking at? Because your repairs are higher than your equipment. Costs. Yeah. <clears throat> so, 50353 fire equipment that's basically kind of an umbrella term for any equipment we purchase to do the job that's not otherwise specified and then equipment repair that's for that includes all of the building like the equipment of the building not the building itself it's like when the generator we have problems with the generator we use the equipment line to repair the generator and we use building maintenance to fix like the door that was leaking and the sheetrock that got damage and things like that just as examples um that equipment repair line just all these numbers reflect i look at the last however many years take an average of those look at what we did and then deputy chief ham and i set like what we're going to be buying forward so we have plans to this year we're going to replace the tires on this truck this year and that's where things come like maintenance wise and things like that and then like this year like this year as an example we had to send all of our extrication equipment out to get repairs done because it was some of it was you know prevented maintenance and some of it was stuff that needed to get that that broke um so yeah maintenance of the equipment especially as we get an older fleet what my intent to do over the next however many years is kind of like change those numbers out so that we're replacing equipment which will be lower maintenance instead of keeping older equipment that is higher maintenance so, it's so on, your equipment, on your equipment repairs, you're looking at preventative maintenance on that aspect of it also? Yep. Yeah. So that includes all of our oil changes, services, repla like chains, it's replacement chainsaws and things like that. That's falling under the maintenance and care of the, of the equipment itself. All right. I have a question on the scuba. Mm-hmm. 
um, you and I, you and I've had discussions about that over the past couple of years. Yeah. Is is are are we at the point now where we're um, swapping um, swapping them out as they expire, or is this for maintenance and certifications of the equipment? It's for maintenance. It's for the certification, like we talked about, where you have yep. to get it pressure tested, uh, and then replacing equipment as it gets. You know, things break. Like we go into burning buildings with these, right. and then they you, get you smashed have to replace because you'll let, yep. you can only use them once. Like yeah, I bought know. like this year out of this line. I bought four masks that were smaller. Yeah. You know, not everybody that works the fire department has nice chubby cheeks like I do, and so we had to get masks that fit smaller faces. Um, so that comes out of that line. Okay, so uh, so we're at the point now where we're not going to have the huge fifty dollar, fifty thousand dollar a year um, budget request for. Replacing a bunch. I never want to say never, but, but it is I mean, not it's, we're, an we're, anticipated we're, cost. Okay, so we'll, we could expect to see like five thousand each year Correct. for that. Correct. Consistent we're at, upkeep. At a point where where we we, we need to be. Yes. Okay. My intent since taking over as chief has been to have a plan going forward. Again, some things come up. I didn't know MediaMS was going to require me to have a medical director. Right. It just came out and now I have to do it. And FBA might change something that I have to do it. I kind of get stuck by these outside agencies. But my plan is to have, and the group, those of you that sit on capital improvement has seen a plan that's outdated now because the price of everything tripled. But again, outside of my control. But we have a plan. We're replacing this truck then, we replace this SBA there. And that plan goes beyond hopefully but longer than I work here. Like I'd like to retire someday. <laughs> but it, it continues oh, to grow. Only with 35 the town. years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yes, that I anticipate the number should stay roughly the same. Yeah, I mean, because you, you would, you would um, said that that's what you were hoping to, to yep. reach that point. So I was. Um, I just wanted to clarify that that's where from both the business pending, and pending no um, major uh, recertifications from that come down from on high. Yeah, my whole plan is, is approaching this from a business standpoint and as a taxpayer standpoint is to come up with a predictable number so that we always have a rough idea of where we're going to be. I like to have a plan. Um, okay. So. Now your fuel cost estimation here is that before the uh, <laughs> well before so yes, so fuel well, costs we've true. kept relatively the same because of the fuel fluctuations and so the last two years I came in under and I was you know that money gets returned to the town because it's a kind of a gamble where the world be fuel prices wise this year I imagine I'll probably anticipating to fall right at that number but it's going to totally depend on what fuel does because we buy predominantly diesel and that's five and something now so I'm, I'm hoping Rick if they can make a deal with Canada maybe the prices will head back down <laughs> be good to take a little break somewhere yeah you guys have a large storage of diesel over there? No. We, the town had done, looked into stuff like that before, but it's better for us, like upkeep, maintenance, and all that wise, to just, we, we buy it in a bulk system through uh, a WEX account. So we get, a, we get a discount, and then we don't pay all the tax and stuff on it, too. Some. That was my next question. Yep. Sorry. Bulk. No, that's all right. Yeah, we, we, we have a uh, WEX fleet account, and so we get a fleet discount on all the fuel we buy. Um, Life, Life Flight has made a request for 600 and some odd dollars. Yep. Do you use that facility much, or is that just a hit or miss? Or? We probably call them one to two times a year, mm -hmm. uh, which the helicopter itself, obviously, we have no, we don't, they're a private organization. But the helicopter itself, when they come out, comes with a flight certified paramedic, a flight nurse, blood, the ability to rapid sequence intubate people, things that we can't do in the field. That helicopter has saved citizens of this town's lives, mm -hmm. like a lot of them. And they're a great, a great service that really takes care of us, especially now that they're located in Sanford. We get a helicopter a lot faster. Have they not always been located in Sanford? Nope. They used to be in Lewiston and uh, or like yeah Lewiston and then Augusta um, and then the next closest ones are Boston Midflight and Dart and Dart's in Lebanon New Hampshire hmm. so now that there's a base in Sanford we've been able to kind of do both so we do scene calls where the helicopter comes out and will meet us on scene or, or close to it we've done 
handoffs at the airport. So we'll drive something to the airport, load them in the helicopter, and then they can go to Boston, which is a lot faster. Um, and now that they're in Stanford, they actually do ground scenes. So like if the weather's bad, they have a SUV that they hop in and come out to us and can still provide us with blood and another set of hands and all mm. that. So it's it's been really good that they moved down to Sanford to have a base there. So, so are we making a donation so that they stay viable? Or they, yeah. they say that they're a nonprofit, so I'm, I'm kind of... Yep, they use their donations to keep them up and running. If you look at, you've got the numbers in front of you, I think if you pulled our ambulance billing versus our cost of operation, it doesn't, one doesn't cover the other. And so helicopter medical billing doesn't cover the operation, and so they work a lot with donations. Gotcha. <coughs> well, we're at, <clears throat> I think you survived the wrath of the chairman of the Warren Finance Committee. <laughs> of the year. I'm always so happy to come talk to you guys. You just got to give me plenty of warning, like I said. I'm a busy guy. Um, again, I, I support, I look very closely at your budget and myself personally. Uh, I support everything you ask for. I appreciate it. I would like to also reiterate that as Warrant Finance and Fire Chief, we have set strict lines of communication. But if you ever, as individual taxpayers, have questions about fire department operations or what we do or how to volunteer or maybe send some of your siblings over, mm -hmm. uh, please come see me, right? We have a website, actingfirerescue.org. Um, I think it's a really nice website, but I built it. So uh, <laughs> go ahead and check it out, see what you think. We have Facebook. And then my email is on the town's website, swing over the station, ask questions, whatever it may be. I want to interact with the town. I want to answer their questions. I want to be there for you. That's my job. So if you guys have questions or anything like that about operations or why we did something, anything like that, talk to me, all right? Don't call us on the phone necessarily at the station because we don't have voicemail. We don't have, that phone system was the original one from 1998. Uh, hasn't been updated. I'll probably be asking for that in the next couple of years, Warren Finance. Uh, <laughs> we also don't have air conditioning, Warren Finance, so I'll just throw that out there. <laughs> Future discussions. You got big bay doors. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yep. yeah. Um, and when it's hot and humid. <laughs> yeah, we wouldn't air condition the bay, but I would air condition the living quarters. Uh, we just have window units like everybody else, but it's, it's it's all on to do list you know we've been looking at looking at things i write grants constantly so this year i got two i think i got two i don't know i'd have to look back i got one grant for thirteen hundred dollars for safety equipment so we bought helmets gloves and hoods um currently waiting to hear back on our afg grant which would replace our cascade system the system we used to refill the scba uh, because of our small community size i don't they cover everything but like 3% of a grant. And so if the grant's small enough, I don't have to request funds because it falls below the 5,000. So this one would be like 2,500, I think I would have to make up for our half, our 3% our of the grant or whatever it may be. So uh, I didn't even bring it before because that was in, within our 5,000 for SCBA. So I, like I said, I constantly pursue these grants. Like in the middle of COVID, we got $15,000 to ensure that people got brought to the hospital that needed to go for non-emergent reasons. And so we gave people rides and made sure people got care and checked in on people. And then we upgraded some of our uh, COVID equipment, lockers, things like that, so we could keep our clothes clean and separated and make sure we're not bringing that stuff home to our families, so. I have one quick question. Sure. Um, do you guys provide, I assume training under 504 is you guys' training, right? Okay, I didn't know if you folks offer, I wanna say training, but like ice safety stuff for like residents where you're like, let's go on the ice and this is what happens if you fall through the ice and cause we're a lake town. Absolutely, so pre-COVID, I had all these plans. <laughs> <laughs> then COVID happened and I couldn't do any of them. Ruined everything. We're starting back up again, so. We're going to start offering regular CPR instruction, okay? Uh, those things will be posted. We're gonna start doing more community outreach now that we can safely meet again as a community. Mm -hmm. And just to throw the quick plug in there, on May 21st, we're gonna have an open house. It's our 50th plus two anniversary because we were supposed to have a 50th anniversary in 2020. So, uh, 
Big Bash. State police, game wardens, forest rangers. Hopefully you get life light up there. State police and game wardens. I ain't going to that. Well, we'll get you a little bit. Your sister would love that. Demonstrations. You can still right? wear your mask. Demonstrations. You yeah. We'll have some type of education component. We're, uh, I have a committee that's doing that. Gotcha. That's their whole jam. Okay. Um, and so we're going to be doing more community outreach now. That's is that the, the budget question. in here or is that just community stuff? Both. Both. So I have 1850 in fire prevention. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's what that would yeah. be under. Okay. 1850. So that falls under fire prevention. Gotcha. That 1850 covers all of our community outreach. It covers uh, us going to the schools. So we go to school every October and we talk about fire safety and mm -hmm. all kinds of different stuff. Okay. And we're hoping to do more and more as we can. Again, it takes some money, lots of time and people. Mm -hmm. And so these are all things that are hard to get right now. But Ricky, cool. thank you. Many years ago, when you were real little, the fire department went around town and gave out stickers to residents with children mm -hmm. uh, to put on their windows. Um, and obviously, it hasn't done, been done, I know of anyway, for many, yeah. many years. Because tactics have changed. So they originally gave the sticker idea out as like, okay, this is rapid access to the kids. So if there's a fire, no. we can get them out. What was happening was they found that crews were going into those windows and they were now an office. They were now something else. Nobody kids took the stickers now. off. <laughs> and they're searching a room looking for a baby or a no. child or whatever it may be. No. And oh, it's wow. not that anymore. Yeah. And so now we've just changed our, our so wasted process. wasted precious time. Correct. So we've yeah. changed our process that we thoroughly searched the house every single room every single time oh, I, I appreciate it i, I didn't give it These a thought the kind of why I love to they get weren't still doing that you know absolutely well, we're a small community you know most of us right most, most of, of you. us <laughs> well, so you you know that there's no kids in my house mm -hmm. i don't know that maybe no. they're over visiting maybe you've got family <laughs> exactly you know what i'm saying so yeah. we never yeah. assume yeah. anything no. Okay. No. I mean, that I've got, totally I've got sense, seven right? grandkids. You don't know whether they're... Yeah, we've rescued dogs and cats. The difference well, congrats is... congrats this dogs week on rescuing the dog. <laughs> cats, you just have to walk by. So if you go in a... <laughs> if the house is on fire and you go by the cat, the cat will attach itself and you just bring it out. A dog, you'll actually have to hold. And yes, we did rescue a dog out. We yes. assisted in rescuing a dog off the app. The dog kind of got itself out. Oh, uh, sunshine? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> good we're, job. We're good for one or two dogs a winter that we pull off the <laughs> pull off or out of the ice. Um, Ooh, it makes me nervous. I don't like it. I don't like it. <laughs> it's better for us to do it with our suits and training than for general citizens to do it, because generally then that turns us into rescuing one or two citizens, which has happened before too if they decide to rescue them themselves before we get there. Dogs are a lot more resilient in ice water than you are. So what makes me the most nervous about us. living there with Samin. Makes me the most nervous. I don't like it. You don't want to be nervous, don't go on the ice. <laughs> is that it, everybody? Uh, yes. Oh. Uh, One more. The, the Acting Planning Board is considering a regulation or a ordinance. ordinance on uh, people renting out their cottages or yep. their houses and whatever. And um, as far as the emergency uh, procedures, if, if, if there was a fire or, or people getting in there, do you, how do you feel about having the time to go and inspect these particular houses? Do you have the time to do it? Should you be charging the town or the people to do it? Or so where do you stop and start with this? Part of that is in the 10 hours that I have requested for Deputy Chief Ham to, to help spearhead that project. I don't know, we, we have a rough idea of how many occupancies we'll be inspecting. I might have to come back and say, hey, I need another 10 hours for Deputy Chief Ham to make sure that gets all done. Obviously we'll have support from the other staff there too, but you still have to have somebody coordinate and schedule these type of things. And um, the code enforcement officer and I today talked about it just to start to hammer out some type of plan. It's a it's an ordinance that I support as a fire chief because it's I want to make sure that everybody who lives and visits our community is safe, uh, and we just want to make sure that they're they're staying in a safe place, especially if they're from away, renting you know paying to rent a, a facility. If you go to stay at a hotel, they're highly regulated on exits and lighting and sprinklers and fire alarms and all that. Right now, if you rent your basement out to somebody that comes up for the weekend there's not a lot of regulations and i don't think that's fair to the person from away who doesn't know necessarily what they're walking into because all they've looked at is some pictures on on the internet did you uh anticipate that 
in your 10 hours? And uh, do you really think that people, what percentage of people actually renting out houses will, will get involved with this program? So I can't force anybody to follow the law, uh, but all we can do is encourage and educate so that people hopefully do. And the, and the 10 hours a week probably won't cover all of it, mm -hmm. but it's a step in the right direction and we have to make um, careful steps because we want to make sure that we don't overstep or we ask too much from the community all at one time. We want to make things gradual and grow as we grow. Is, will Deputy Ham have other inspections other than this? Yep, so we inspect the two bars, the three wedding barns, the town hall gets inspected, the school gets inspected, fire station gets inspected. Like we, we all commercial, public, uh, places of assembly, uh, gotta get into the churches, things like that. Any place where there's, there's certain things that are required to have inspections. And right now we get most of them done. We need to get all of them done. And so I need, I need more help <laughs> getting that stuff done. Because it's not just doing the inspection, it's doing the paperwork after you do the inspection. Yeah, and documentation and follow-up. Because if everybody was perfect and followed all the laws, it would be very simple. But when you go to these places and they don't, it becomes a lot more arduous. In the and then you go back a second time. Or 19th. <laughs> <laughs> we have a fire extinguisher program for citizens. I know citizens that elderly. Training or? No, just uh, they have like a home kitty type of fire extinguisher but i found out recently that had it since like 1922 or something like that you know? <laughs> yeah we don't do any exchange or, or or we don't give them out or anything like that it would be cost prohibitive um well we don't take them back either but we can you know if you have questions about how to dispose of it or things like that or uh you know you can absolutely reach out i've used one would be good Yep, and we do, that was, that will be part of the open house. We'll probably have a fire extinguisher demonstration. We're gonna have some like smokehouse demonstration type stuff. There'll be an opportunity to sit and talk with me because not every citizen gets to do that. Um, we got lots of stuff planned. It should be a really good time. And we'll have food. Well, thanks for all the food. Thank you. Ray. There we go, now he's in. <laughs> Don't forget the police though. <laughs> <laughs> Put his sunglasses on. <laughs> I'm <laughs> 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 So. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank, thank you so much. Yes. Um, thank you for what you do, and uh, good luck at town meeting. Thank you. And we'll see what happens between now and then. Yep. All I can do is continue to advocate for my department and my people. Yep. You do a good job at it. Thank you. That's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> All right. Thank you, board. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Get some sleep. I'm gonna go and get dinner first. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing I want to talk just a little bit about tonight, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on it, is our meeting last week with the road commissioners. Um, I've done a little bit of checking. Um, for example, we were told um, by District 2 road commissioner that it cost him $1,000 a week to rent a broom to sweep the roads. A sweeper, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I've done a little bit of checking, and United Rental, you can rent that same sweeper for $874 for a month. So I think we're a, a little, misled there. The skid steer that we're paying, I'm sorry, I don't have it here in front of me. Uh, I might be able to pull it up. I think we have it right The multi-use tractor skid steer? Yes, here. yeah. 83.66 an hour. So if you subtract the $30 an hour that we're paying the road commissioner from that, that leaves you at what about fifty six dollars an hour, and this same outfit here, um, you can rent the same skid steer for forty dollars an hour. And yet they're one a seven percent increase. This this is this is where I'm going with it. But that increase also includes the gas used to do it, 
But you are, when you rent this, no. when you rent this, you're putting the fuel in it too. You know what I mean? It's are these so, all so the items that they rent or are these items that they own? This is all stuff <laughs> they either own or rent. Oh, so we don't yeah. know if they're owning or renting it. They're renting it to the town. Oh, I see what you're saying. I see yeah. what you're saying. Here it, is. Here it is. Here's the uh, verb attachment. So. Years ago, they used to rent the, the sweepers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it was expensive, but they just used it for, well, they did the town hall, they did the corners, any place where there's a lot of sand. Yeah. Uh, now they're using more salt. So. The other thing that I checked into, uh, and I brought it up at a meeting, was the dollar increase in loading sand down at the sand shed. Um, it takes about 10 minutes to load up an eight yard truck. Okay. I'm pretty close there, aren't I, Tucker? Generous. Yeah. Generous. Yeah, yeah it doesn't take that long, but right. I'm, if I'm, you're including warm up and stuff for the machine, no, you got a you got a machine down there running. It takes you about ten minutes to load a truck. At the rates we're paying now on an eight yard truck, which most of the sand is a lot of the sand is our eight yard. Um, that is. 22.50? a low. 15, yeah. Okay. Well, when you change that to 350, now we're up to $28 a load. So then what I want you to think about is if it takes 10 minutes to load a truck, that means at that rate you can load six trucks an hour so when you add up per yard at 350 a, a yard then you add the road commissioners pay on top of that you're at a little over 200 dollars an hour for that loader and that's the way you got to look at it That's only if, <clears throat> that's only if the road commissioner is using it, right? And yes. Then they but subtract the thirty-one dollars an hour. Mm, no. But you're, you're not. I don't believe you. That, that's that's board. different. That that's not. That's not. Down the down to the sand shed, they're not figuring it as an equipment rate, Margarita. Okay. They just give them uh, so much per yard. So it doesn't matter if you're using a loader that's a two yard loader or a 10 yard loader. Okay. It's just so much per, per yard. Gotcha. So in the average would be depending on the winter, we'd use about 4,000 yards of uh, material, sand, salt a year. Well, if it's two thousand on each end of town, at two fifty a yard we're paying now is five thousand and five thousand here for the other end of town. Uh, that's ten thousand dollars a year. I have a question. So before you, before I, because I lose my train of my thought yeah. real easy, being an old man now. Uh, <laughs> uh, wow. well, somebody's it'd be more cost effective for us as a town to go out and purchase a loader. And be, we'll be in three years, we'll be saving money. So if you change that to 350 at 2,000 yards, now you're paying $7,000 for each end, which is a total of 14. Now you also have to take in consideration 
they were also paying them for their loaders by the hour when they put this material in the building. So if we're going to spend fifteen, twenty thousand dollars a year renting a loader from these companies, uh, I'd say we need to take a hard look at buying our own loader. And with each increase, that time that you break even becomes shorter. Yes. Yeah. I'm just saying, at two hundred dollars an hour, yeah. at that rate. That is absolutely crazy. This is your yeah. area of expertise, right? I'm just waiting to weigh in. Well, go I'd ahead. Like, no, I, yeah, you, a, I've been waiting for Tucker. I'll, 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 I, I don't believe you were here at the original I, no, I, I when they were uh, here. I missed this meeting last week. So yeah. I'd like to hear your, like, your general thoughts on this, on I, what, what you think is appropriate and inappropriate. I starred this one when I was looking through it just earlier. Um, the loader at the stockpile, I mean, the dollar increase it seems like a lot of money to me kind of what i would like to see is just a flat rate for each road commissioner's loader can we interrupt uh, for a second what you got i didn't know it was your granddaughter yeah do you want to come now or do you want to wait i'll wait honey okay can i come over and give you a hug oh of course you can Aww. Grandpa, i got a I, basket you did again tonight oh, what the heck we almost went up against Shackley. We almost. Almost one? Yeah, it was like 20 to 20. <laughs> then um, Colin got a basket at the last second, and then they didn't count it. Holy smokes. <laughs> Good thing I wasn't there. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, I had no idea who it was. If, if you weren't there, you would have said something. I would have said something. Yeah. All right, so go ahead. Um, I'll share with you, with us. What, my opinion, what makes more sense for this is just to give a flat rate to each road commissioner, because they each have their own loader down there. A lot of times with contractors, guys don't get along. Nobody wants to share. I definitely get Dennis's point as far as the amount of money that we're spending I mean to buy a decent loader right now is a lot of money I mean I've looked into getting loaders and stuff and I can't touch anything that I don't have to work on every day for less than 25 grand and they'd have to share and that that's old that's junk yeah, yeah. Um, if you wanted to get something new that we don't have to wrench on all the time I mean you're talking 80,000 to 200,000 mm -hmm. um, what I see I mean, granted, the money would be there because that's what we're we're spending in essence. Right. But I think it would work good for one year. When it breaks, who's responsible for fixing it? Mm -hmm. Who's doing oil changes? Who's going to get fuel for it? I just i I don't see that working. I mean, if we in the future, we're probably eventually going to work toward a public works department, just because it's just the way everything's going right now. I don't like to say that, but that would be the time to get the equipment because the town currently does, I believe, unless it's been sold, has a couple pieces of equipment. One of them is a sander. And if you look down through, I think it's still worded that way. Contract, yeah, they got two, Tucker. Contract two sanders. Two eight, and two eight yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then I believe there's, um, what they call it, like a front runner rake or something that yeah. goes on a truck. And the town has had that forever. That's a really nice sander, but it's been sitting for so long because nobody wants to put their money in parts into it to use it and then get less money to be able to use it. So I, I don't like the idea of the town buying equipment in the situation that we're in right now. As of this moment. Right. But, I mean, you, you look at these numbers as far as the loader stockpile, it is a ton of money. And when you've been up for 30, 40 hours, plowing maybe that's exaggerated 24 hours plowing mm -hmm. straight are you that's keeping reasonable. track of your yardage exactly i mean when i go in and get a bucket of sand out if it's a two and a half yard loader it's not going to be exact every time mm -hmm. so when these numbers start to go up that makes me worry um just because that small margin of error is magnified and multiplied in each bucket that you're going in right. i mean granted it's a lot of money for these guys, even with older loaders, to put them in there. They have to be compensated for that. But I really think it would be a lot more fair if we just gave a flat rate to each of them to park a loader down there. They know exactly how much money they're going to get paid for that loader in 
the building to load their trucks and they can buy loaders according to that. They know what they're going to spend. Well, the, the thing is, Doc, if I can interrupt you for a second. The loaders they're using down there are $25,000 loaders. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, in some years past, they weren't even $20,000 loaders. Uh, until 10 years ago, there was always one loader down there. Mm -hmm. One loader. The road commissioners, one year, um, Yadin would have his loader down there. The next year, King would have his loader down there, and they'd take turns going back and forth. Um, I just think this, they, we, we just changed the rates for loading a couple of years ago. Changed it to 250. Mm -hmm. Just, I think it was two years ago. To go up another dollar, it makes absolutely no sense to me because what's changed? Right. You still got a $20,000 loader down there. And, and I agree with what you're saying. You know, if you want a nice one, you can pay 60, 80, 100. But these aren't big loaders they're running. Mm -hmm. All right, they got what, three yard buckets. Mm -hmm. The 950 runs three yard bucket. Because I, again, migrated to this stuff my whole life. Uh, not like Tucker does, Tucker has his own business. I work for other people. So some of this stuff is a stretch for me mm -hmm. because it makes no sense. So this was the question that I had and I, I don't know if it's an appropriate question or not. It may be a Any stupid question. Any question is appropriate. They asked for a big increase to the road commissioner's wage, right? Oh. And it's most likely not, it's not what's suggested, right? Right. Are the increases down here, do you think, in mental preparation for them knowing that they're not gonna get that big increase? When they so made they these- Make it up in other ways? The exact words two years ago. <clears throat> we're not gonna give you much more money, but you're gonna make up for it in the equipment increases. Okay, this is why when they set the wage for $18 an hour for a laborer, so you're going to pay, um, I'll pick on Will, the town when Will hires, because they're not employees anymore. Mm -hmm. They did away with them being town employees. So when they, when we was going to, uh, so we're going to reimburse Will's business $18 an hour for a flagger out here. Well, you get another 5 or $6 an hour for workman's comp and all that on there. So... It was, Will was losing, his business was losing money, mm -hmm. getting reimbursed $18 an hour for that employee. So they changed it this year. They increased it by $4 an hour. Mm -hmm. So then, and that also goes with the operators. The operators are going up. Because we, we were paying the operators $2,701. Well, the operators going up four dollars. That's going to put the operators up to thirty one oh one. That this is what going to be reimbursed well for his operators. Now, as a road commissioner, he's more than just a supervisor. Okay, he's a manager. And there's a big difference between a manager and a supervisor. So if you put up, say, the 7% increase that the Slutman uh, suggested, they're going to get paid $32 and some change. But we're reimbursing, oh, that's on our dime because they are employees as road commissioners. But we're paying 3101 for an operator. So there's like a dollar difference. It doesn't make any sense to me. It just makes no sense. I mean, I've done a lot of, I started working on the roads 50 years ago. And 
my family has been involved in it many, many years. So I do have a lot of knowledge on justification for stuff, and plus my experience um, just doing budgets and war and finance. And I appreciate somebody like Tucker, somebody like Will, somebody like Adam. But they have to be true numbers. I don't want to hear that you had to buy a $800 tire because that's all figured into the rates when you charge for a piece of equipment. Mm -hmm. The equipment is rates are figured for two things, operation and repairs, maintenance, and replacement. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's how the rates are set up through the whole country. That's what I would assume. That's yes. what I would assume on all of this. And so <coughs> when I did my research, remember the, the cut off saw conversation, mm -hmm. how that wheel is $200? Uh, that's absolutely true. There's as much as $300. But if you're working in the city of Sanford, you're going to use up one of those a week. If you're working in the town of Acton, you might use one up in two years. And, and the use of those aren't limited to working for Acton. And, and that, okay. that, exactly. Okay. They aren't limited to work, just working for the town. They can always use it on private jobs. Okay. Money on that item everywhere else. And, and so this is my issue. Like when I brought up well, a chain for a chainsaw only costs 20 bucks. How long do you get out of that? All summer. You know what I mean? So, uh, it, I don't think myself, I'm not going to argue these points because I think I'm probably going to um, lose in the end. But I will tell you, and, I, and I've done all this stuff here, and I just wanted to point out to everybody exactly what we're really talking about here. And I would much encourage whatever this committee decides to do. Um, and I don't know what the slot men are going to do or what the townspeople are going to do. But another year to sit down and do an honest thing, you know, research and, and, and to make sure everything is where it should be. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like my, 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 when I made my statement uh, last meeting, Tucker, uh, you can go down and buy a decent chainsaw for $400. You know, depends on what you're doing, but working around the town and stuff, because they have all, all the tree stuff done, private contractor anyway, they don't even do it anymore. So you can go down and buy a, a, a chainsaw for $400, and looking at that increase, I mean, we're going to be paying $12 an hour for chainsaw. That's extreme. I think it goes back to what you said, though, Margarita, which is a great point. If we kind of say, this is never going to happen, th this rate. $10 rate increase. This yeah. $10 rate. Which they probably know. Okay, it's that's cool. <laughs> but we can, you know... We can, do it elsewhere. we can do it elsewhere. I mean, you know, there are things but, I understand but about. But we don't want to fudge the equipment. But we're not fudge. We shouldn't do it. Because mm -hmm. then I can look at a laborer with no equipment. I can look at a flagger. And they're saying, well, he was 22, we want, uh, 18. We want him to be 22 because we lose money on him. Why do you lose money on him? Well, one thing we need to, should keep in mind that the cost of the to the employer workman's comp whatever they give them benefits can be as high as 25 percent so you know if, if somebody's making 18 bucks an hour it's going to cost his employer another four dollars and fifty cents to you know have this workman's comp and everything he needs for him then we can have a a good discussion about that but if we're talking about monopoly money, it's not a good discussion mm -hmm. in my book. When I see, and thank you for putting these in percentages, because like that dollar increase is a good example. You say a dollar is nothing. Okay, but then 
when I say, okay, it's a 40% increase for something that you, <laughs> how the hell do you justify such a thing? You can't. Right. And, that and, was and my thing about, before right. about and the it's 23% this on the laborer. How do you justify from last year to this year? You can't say it's because gas costs more. Or, or, you know, you know, you know what I mean? No, no, I, I appreciate yeah. what you're saying, Phil, but yeah. Yeah. when this stuff was handed to the two road commissioners two years ago, Joe Letourneau and Will Langley, here's what it's going to be. That's exactly how it happened. Here you go. Mm. Okay? And the, the rate of pay for the road commissioners, when everybody else in, in the municipality has been getting these 3 percent, 4 percent, 5 percent raises, since 2017, the road commissioner's wage hasn't changed. So if you want to give them 7 percent, all right, well, that's pretty good for this year. But how about the last five years when everybody else was getting 3% and they got nothing? It goes right back to what Ricky was saying tonight about the marketplace. And I feel if the town of Shapley, as you all know, is paying $34 and something for their road commissioners, I don't understand why our road commissioners aren't worth the same as our neighboring town. It doesn't make any sense to me. And myself personally, I would think, I think $40 is a little high, but I think 35 is reasonable mm -hmm. in today's wages. Mm -hmm. I, I really don't. There's a big difference. So. Yes, and there's a big difference. There is a big difference. Yeah. I mean, you have to realize, too, these are part-time workers. This is not a full-time job. Mm -hmm. Okay, historically, road commissioners throughout the year would work 12 to 15 hours a week average. Adam working for the town of Shapley, uh, he can tell you very clearly this week said there is no work. It didn't snow, nothing to do. <laughs> so it, it's a part-time job. I think some of these increases are uh, trying to put it into a full-time job. We have voted twice in the last 10 years saying we didn't want it a full-time job, the town, town meeting has. Uh, and I'd just be very skeptical moving forward with some of this stuff because the sum of maintenance of 25,000, well, I heard two things. Uh, well, that's gonna be absorbed in the price increases for the equipment. What? Uh, what I want to know is what are we going to get done for that 25000 It's just like me asking about the shoulder work. What's the cost per foot? You guys doing it? What's the cost per foot when you hired uh, F.I. Carroll to do it? If I don't care if it costs more for our road commissioners to do it. You know, when I'm just putting these numbers out there, say it's a, a dollar a foot. If our road commissioners uh, out there and our road crews trying to make some money uh, and it costs us a dollar ten, I really don't care. You know, it doesn't amount to a hill of beans. Mm -hmm. But what if it's a dollar to have F.I. Carroll do it and we're paying two fifty? Where's the data that says what it costs for us to do it? I think that's a very reasonable question. You know what I mean? Is 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 because we to make recommendations like we're supposed to be. Uh, I want to know what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. and I want everybody on this committee to. Um, and, it, and I understand, like you, Margaret. I'm not criticizing, but not being in the world that Tucker's in. You know what I mean? So there's a lot of it that you. You don't understand. I'm not a subject matter expert. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm not either. But there's so. but there's also things that you do that <clears throat> I wouldn't have a clue. Mm -hmm. you, you know what I mean? I don't know what I don't know. Uh, and, it, and it's nice to to take people for face value, but then when something clicks and say, wait a minute, let me look at some of this stuff because this just doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, and it's kind of like Tucker said. Some of it don't make any sense.
Because our, our function really is only to make sure the town of Acton gets the value for the money we spend, period. 100%. And that doesn't always, value does not always relate at all necessarily to the cost of something. Right. Um, so, okay, is this $1.40% increase? There's no value in that. Not to the town, because what you're talking about, Please Phil, is a $4,000, you're talking about a $4,000 increase. Yeah. Right, so the town, the town's not getting value on, on, the, on a lot of no. things that I look at, but just my opinion. I, I know it, it, because it, I just, I'm a natural, tackle to tell you, uh, lightning rod there, so. Uh, <laughs> but, but you gotta, okay, you gotta figure out much it's the truth. cost of the town to own and maintain a loader and have it set, and are they gonna use it for sand, salt, then what are they gonna use it for? Of course for? they will use it all summer. Yeah. What else, what else went on? What's that? What else are they going to use it for in the summer? They can use it to uh, um, well, clean, up, clean up the sand. I'm they can use it. But well, we can't make that recommendation right now. No. Our, our situation, we're, we're between private they, contracts. They can use it for shoulder work. And possibly going into a municipal, um, you know, uh, Public works. Public oh, works. No, I appreciate that, that, Joe. Every, every town has got to go through this at some point. And there's a bridge, you know, and what do you do? But I'm not going to pay $40,000 a year for a loader. Do that every year. In five years, you've paid 200000 It doesn't make any sense. It just doesn't make any sense. Financially, because we're throwing our money away, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, the town of Milton, they own a bunch of equipment. Town of Wakefield owns a bunch of equipment. Uh, but they have highway departments. They right? Yeah, they have highway departments. They have highway departments. Yeah. Right. Um, but the same thing, though, talk about like that one that's sitting down there that nobody will use, that sanded down there. Right. Why? Why won't anyone use it, or why, They've is, used it, it. why is it still sitting there? No, but until two years ago, <laughs> it was always used. Two? Right. Did Joe use it, or? No, that's when it stopped. Okay. Joe didn't use it, but what I'm saying is, for 20 years, both of them were getting used all the time. Right. And I'll tell you why. And you know as well as I do because they don't make no money with it. Because right. they're getting, as the rates, you can see in here the increase in their rates, uh, you make a lot of money back. Because uh, you're not, these, these people aren't buying brand new sanders and putting them on their trucks. <laughs> they're buying sanders like the one down there and putting them on their trucks. Mm -hmm. And the sander down there is stainless steel and this and that. Uh, it's never going to rust out. I keep saying I'm going to get one more year out of mine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I spotted on long enough. <laughs> and unless somebody has something else, I'd take a motion to adjourn. Can I say, mm -hmm. can I make a comment about the fire department? It was very interesting. Never doing this before, but uh, I think you, sign this and you stated how you felt about what they wanted. And uh, I think it would be short sighted of the town to. Seven percent is, 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 is a problem, first, uh, and I, I so totally agree with what you said. Because if you, you train all these people and spend all this money the town puts in, invest in these people, and, and then you let them go for three or four dollars an hour. You mm -hmm. just that's like the worst business decision you can make. You know? Oh yeah, hundred percent. And then you should have complained on Facebook that it wasn't fast enough and they didn't get good service. <laughs> hey, right. The math real quick, and and like the seven percent between the. Seventeen or fifteen dollars an hour, twenty-five, which covers most, pretty much everybody over there. It's like between a dollar twenty and two twenty an hour. You're not going to keep those people. So, you, so you can go. Yeah, with seven percent seems like a lot in this case. The percentage works the other way to clarify things. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems like a lot, right? If you're at work, I'm getting a seven percent raise. But it, in this case, when you're starting out so far behind, yeah, in a critical area where you cannot afford to lose those people, you've spent over years millions of dollars training uh, that should be a priority so 
Seven, I hope I hope seven percent is not what happens because me too. You're going to have turnover big time. There's too much yeah. competition. You can make more at Walmart. Well, it's a short story. Seven 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 seven. Dunkin' Donuts, yeah. I one of the ones he was talking about tonight without using a name was my granddaughter. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and she works at Applebee's, being Makes a waitress. More. And. Not she, the granddaughter we saw. Here. No, no, not this one. <laughs> but she spent the last two years of high school in training for a firefighter, EMT, paramedic, whatever. And she makes more money at Applebee's than she does going through what she has to go through over here. Saving lives. Isn't that uh, awful? Saving yeah. lives. It doesn't make any sense to me. No. Now, some people say I'm doing this because my granddaughter is doing this now. I say I'm doing it because my granddaughter opened my eyes and showed me what the heck's really going on. And the amount of stuff these people go through. Um, their priorities are yeah. whack. Mm -hmm. Yep. They're changing the economy. All right. Yes. We have a motion to adjourn? We had that already. Yeah. Oh, we do? Yes. Okay, we have a... And we have a second. Well, Bang the gavel, no, man. No, oh, yeah. All in favor. I got a few things I got to say. Don't we have <laughs> we have <laughs> the slotmen have a budget meeting Wednesday at three. I thought it was Tuesday. No, it's it changed to Wednesday. Wednesday. And we have the school town meeting. No, not town meeting. No, the school public hearing on Thursday at at six. Next Monday we are going to go through the zoning ordinances hopefully if they have them ready for us and the following week we're going to do the board of selectmen I did tell Mike Corey so everybody knows I didn't see any reason for him to come and explain his 1% raise or whatever it was for the cable TV and he can spend his time home with his new twins and I don't see any sense at this point um, to have the rec come because their budget's pretty much flat. Um, and any decisions made now will be made for, by the slackmen and that's for their field. Uh, so I don't see any reason for them to have Some to of their come bigger up. things will come uh, out then. You know what I mean? Um, and then that'll give us how long we need in April, one or two meetings to cast our, and I'd like to see, honestly, Tucker and I get in a real good argument or something, because we always get along. It's coming. <laughs> we we always get along. Oh, we'll change seats. Right. You can get a word in. <laughs> <laughs> good night, Joe. <laughs> Yay.